Ladies and gentlemen, what is going on? I hope everybody is doing well. Before we get into the episode, let's take care of the business out of the house. Some sponsorships. And this first sponsor, I think, is incredibly appropriate for this episode. And I hope that people don't get tired of me talking about mental health because I'm not going to. And I'm a huge advocate for seeking help for yourself. And for some people, though, it can be an issue, whether it's an anxiety issue of going and trying to find somebody, or maybe you're geographically isolated, which brings me to the first sponsor of this episode, Better Help. And that's Hotel Echo Lima Papa. Help is one of the sponsors for today's episode. Better Help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed personal therapist. And it's not a long process. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. Of note, this is not a crisis line. This is not self-help. This is professional counseling done securely online. And there are a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. So like I mentioned, this could probably solve the geographic issues for those that might feel isolated from quality care. BetterHelp is a service that is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You're going to get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule a weekly video or phone sessions so you won't have to ever sit in an uncomfortable waiting room if you have anxiety about that. And you can do it right in the comfort of your own home. Since the COVID era is upon us, I have been doing video sessions with my therapist. And you know what? I found them to be just as beneficial as when you're sitting face to face, because I guess technically you are face to face. It's just through video. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they can make it easy and free to change counselors if need be. And that's another important point. Just because you get paired up with somebody and this is goes face to face or whatever when it comes to a therapist doesn't mean that the first fit is going to be the best fit. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. This is going to be more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. You can visit betterhelp.com slash cleared hot. That's BetterHelp Hotel Echo Lima Papa. And join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people actually have been using this service that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I highly recommend you check it out. Special offer for this podcast. You're going to get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash cleared hot. I highly recommend that you take the time, energy, and effort to invest in yourself. Not everybody needs counseling. Not everybody needs that additional boost or buttress of what's going on in their life. But if you do, I highly recommend it. Don't think twice about it. This episode is also brought to you by Onnit, probably the longest running sponsor that I have. And I couldn't be more thankful and proud to have them as a sponsor because I've been using their stuff for years before I actually even had a podcast. If you go to onnit.com slash hot, you're going to see right across the top, total human optimization. And that's what Onnit is, a platform designed to optimize the flesh vehicle that we all walk around life in. At the very top, you'll see supplements, nutrition, fitness, apparel, sale, and more. I'm going to, instead of talking about all the things that they have to offer, I'll just point you into those directions so you can surf and do research on your own time because I don't know how much time you have. And on this main landing page, you're going to see some of the items that I use, not on the daily, but very frequently. And you're going to get up to 10% off when you check out. So if you're interested in optimizing your health and wellness performance, on it.com slash hot. And that's it on the business side of the house. Let's talk about my guest today. Probably my favorite aspect of the podcast, and I had no idea that this was even a possibility when I was considering starting it, is the reconnection with people from my past. So today's guests are Jason and Jessica Silva. Obviously, they're married. And I know Jason and Jessica from my time in the military. When I checked into SEAL Team 5 in 1997, Jason was already attached there, and he was getting ready to begin his journey to development group on the East Coast, which he did, successfully made it through selection, and I followed behind him a few years later and actually ended up working with him 
in the same squadron. And then after leaving the squadron, as things often do in the military and just life in general, people go down their own path. And we recently reconnected, which, again, couldn't be more thankful that that happened. Jason and Jessica are awesome. And I'm glad that I got the chance to speak to them together because I can talk from the military member's perspective. Jason can talk from the military member's perspective. Jessica can talk from the family perspective, from the spouse's perspective. And I think it's very important to look at those relationships from both of those angles or as many angles as you possibly can. Um, I knew Jason, or know Jason much better than I did Jessica, but I did have some contact with her when we were both on the East Coast. But they're both amazing individuals. And if you read the description on either YouTube or iTunes, their accomplishments are unbelievable. Jason had a phenomenal military career. He is very humble in his description of it. And Jessica has had a phenomenal career across a variety of spectrums as well. And I think the best thing that I can do is not try to describe it and let them speak for themselves and the successes and failures and struggles that they encountered along the way. So episode number 139 with Jason and Jessica Silva. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, wait a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. I don't even know actually where to start because we've been recording for the last few minutes, so. I figured. And then I can just splice it in there when was the last time we actually saw each other i think it was when i brought the team three squadron out and you did a little bit of the rso work that's right i'm pretty sure that was the last time we ever ran into each other and that was in 2009 that's right i forgot about that that's where it was like a 40 well, 45 minute clearance i was just like kind of tripping out by it all yeah it was a super that and by that you should also reference that was incredibly fast for them yes <laughs> <laughs> That's it, right. No, I think the the last time that we were working together, I was I was at LPO and I was miserable. Everybody was like a spoiled war hero, and I was supposed to be Jody's two IC, and I went to Black. Oh, you're talking about working, and working together, working, and working, gold. Okay. And I went to Black, and that and then you went on that deployment and got shot. I was supposed to be on that deployment with you. Yep. Yeah, that was a shitty day. That was, for sure. <laughs> sounded <laughs> shitty. You know. You referenced the 45 minutes clearance. It was, people ask me all the time, what was the difference between going from the East Coast back to a conventional team? And I, tr I try to at least do my best job of explaining that the community in general, in my opinion, is amazing. And oh my God. And development group is comprised of people from that community. So it's not like they're these people who are multiples or magnitudes of order greater, but you just practice a lot. Well, no. Particularly in the MST. Yeah, team guys are team guys. <laughs> we were just really good at that one little thing. I always used to tell guys, you, you take my troop and you put them up against a platoon or a troop of SEALs and just IADs, like sh fire, shoot, move. They would smoke us. But we bring in gunships and yeah. Apaches. They were just good team guys. We but were very you, good in the kill house. I was going to say, if you brought that same troop and you're like, go hide to the best of your ability inside of this kill house, we are going to fuck yeah, you yeah. up. That was the biggest shift for me that I noticed because I had, from that deployment, obviously, I left the command, I went to Buds, and I went back to Team 3. And it was still a little bit palpable, the difference in experience for one, because I would say 60% of Team 3 at that time was going to be on their first rotation. Very new. And we'd go to like mount or do kill house stuff, and it was it was different. Different. It was very different. Different. Now I noticed because I spent <clears throat> when I left Damneck before I came out to Colorado, I spent about six months at Trade Debt on the East Coast. Probably it, the highlight of your career. It, I actually <laughs> loved it. I loved it. I did. I did enjoy it. But it was one of those things. It's like, why did you do? Why did you make this call? And you're you're thinking like you know, step G, yeah. A through Z. And they're like, well, uh, uh, and you're like, holy shit, we got to go back to A. Yeah. And we got to talk about A, then B, then C. And we'll eventually get to G. Or it's even better when they say, what call are you talking about? Because yeah. they didn't realize that there was a call that needed to be made. Yeah. It was crazy. I didn't realize, and again, um, I try to be extremely 
honest with my time. My time at the command was super short. I met the minimum criteria to say I successfully completed it, and then I left. I would have liked to stay. It was actually pretty shitty, the way that I left. Yeah, I don't even know. I mean, I know you got shot. I don't So, <clears throat> I got shot. I came back, and they were going to give me about a year to just chill the fuck out. And they were going to let me go down to Air Ops and just help down in Air Ops at the time. Steg and Eggs actually was down there ha. working, I think, at the time. But he was getting ready to rotate out. And that's actually where I became really good friends with Sanders, is he was rotating in. The resting bitch face. Yes. Oh, Steve's got a fucking <laughs> varsity resting bitch face. And like a Planet of the Apes, like shaved in oh, beard with no, with no upper lip. It's fantastic. You actually. remember his dually? Yeah, the shagging wagon. Oh, so amazing. He yeah. he hated having anything on his car, so his little his base decal that was supposed to be on there, he had it on <laughs> Velcro and he would put it in his windshield when he'd go through the gate and then take it off because he didn't like My recollection is that that vehicle had a purple flame paint job. Yeah, and he had like some weird rhino lining bed that wasn't the right color and it pissed him off and he would get mad at his wife when we'd go on trips if she didn't wash the truck. That sounds exactly like Steve. Did you ever meet Steve, Steve Maybe. Sanders, yeah. he did. You would remember. We were in Green Team together. Yeah, Triple S he's in, he's <laughs> is awesome. his street name. Yeah, he's the best. We were texting the other day, actually. He came up, and it was awesome to reconnect with him. You guys are howling. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm an Air Ops, and uh, the Master Chief at the command at the time, who shall remain nameless, not in the squadron, but of the command, was like, yeah, you're, um, you're going to go back with uh, another squadron. You're going to go do an ops job. I was like, hey, man, um, I'm still using crutches. Uh, I could use a little bit of fucking time off. I can't sleep. I'm drinking far too much. I didn't tell him that part, obviously. But everybody was. It's everybody kind was. kind of a given. It was a given. but it, So I I had, you know, I'm, I'm sure the command got better when it came to dealing with people who were injured. When I got back, so I went Iraq, Germany, civilian flight from Germany to New York, teeny weeny flight from New York to Oceana, get off the plane, went home, and didn't know what to do because nobody called me and said, like, hey, you need to come into work. So when they finally did, like four days later, they're like, go in and see Hutch. Hutch isn't a fucking doctor. So I no. go in to see Hutch, and no disrespect to Hutch, even though I've done many disrespectful things to him. <laughs> I go in and they put an e-stem pad on my leg and they like fired it off for an hour and then I went home with pill bottles lining the the back of the medicine cabinet in the sink and free time on my hands and an insane amount of pain. So I was like, well, I'll just combine these pills with this alcohol. And that's all I did for like fucking months because you guys were still overseas. Everybody, the rook squadron was still overseas. I got shot like 29 days into at least a 90 day. Were you shot before... Liquid primer or after? Liquid primer. Fill me in on liquid primer. John, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a... Oh, oh, okay. I know you're talking about. He took a round in the calf, right? I can't were remember. you on that off with him? No, because they were in OEF. I was in yes. OIF. He got hit. It wasn't the same deployment. I'm just trying to put the timeline together. I got shot before Johnny did. Okay, because he was shot probably the next cycle, and he was in the same boat. He had a shitty experience, too. Same, same deal. So I would go to uh, Portsmouth, which is a training hospital as many military hospitals all people don't understand that you know, ask any woman that's given birth there my wife so <laughs> jamie gave jamie gave birth there and we're sitting there and this doctor who looked like he was about seven came in he's like i'm here to do your epidural with that doctor was a grisly old man who looked like santa claus who looked like he obviously had done some epidurals and i said excuse me sir how many have you done and he said well this is going to be my first one on a real patient. I said, you can kindly step the fuck out of this room. And old Santa Claus over there, who could probably throw it from across the room <laughs> to get this shit done. But if you didn't do that, right, they they learned. So I had a time where I went to, in the course of like that first month, I'm sitting at home, I'm fucking sweating, resting heart rate, probably a buck 50, extreme amount of pain. I go to Portsmouth with Jamie. We go there. I check in and like the E4 corpsman, he's doing the intake paperwork. He's like, well, you know, what's the mechanism of injury? I say gunshot wound. And he puts the pen down and he looks at me and he goes, self-inflicted? Wow. wow. And I, I lost my shit for a little bit. <laughs> for a little bit, I lost my Not shit. Lie. And then I sat in the waiting room while people who had like the flu and the sniffles went in for like three hours, sat there. They finally pulled me back 
x-rayed me and then said, do you mind if we bring all the other doctors and residents in? They've never seen a gunshot wound. So it was just early on yeah. in everything that had happened. I don't blame the military for it. It wasn't awesome, but I just don't think that the military was prepared for what was going to come in the future. But that was my experience. So I'm on my own, like, got a little e-stem going on. I'd go to the airloft, trying to fucking figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And then the CMC goes, hey, you're going to go on an ops billet. And I was like... In another squadron, too. In another squadron. And nobody wants to do that when you're that time in your career. So I end up in a meeting in his office. It's just me and him. He's in his khakis. And he says to me you haven't done enough while you've been at this command, so you're going to continue to deploy in a support capacity you know, until your four years is up. And I, he was in his khakis, and I looked at him, and I said, it looks to me like I've done a lot fucking more than you have since I've been at this command. And he stood up, and I, I stood up. I'm like, let's fucking do this. Jeez. And it didn't. And then I went to a chief sport. The only person who came to advocate for me on my chief sport was HB. Um the gold squadron CMC did not show. So HB was there, but they were like, Hey, why do you want to leave? And I told him, I was like, I need some fucking time off. I was told I was going to get some time off. I want to stay. And they're like, well, looks like your choice is to leave. And I said, okay, then I'll leave. And then I became a buzz instructor. Yeah. That was when the, the force <laughs> mass chief was really pushing up and out and spreading the wealth and moving guys around. And if you're not Working in one's position, we're going to put you somewhere else where we can get you out of you. Yeah, it was a weird time. It was a weird time. And, like, what's there was plenty of people to take a little bit of time off. There was. But that was also the, the time when, when I, you know, it was right. I was frustrated right before that where everybody was a spoiled war hero in my mind. Like, yeah, we've gone on two deployments. It's been awesome. And we're doing our thing. And it was painful. Painful time. And then you look back at how the war went, right? Like, the 02 to 05 was dog shit. Kinetically wise, in comparison to the, the especially Iraq, I would say, like I, OIF one. <laughs> uh, uh, I I only know of one guy who actually fired his gun. Oh yeah, you know, and then I hear you know talking to guys like Triple S. He's like you know oh seven eight nine. He was just like oh my god, it was crazy. It was crazy because, and from my understanding, I wasn't there during that time, but people were coming in from other countries, right? Like they were basically coming to get their jihad on. Oh yeah, and the insurgency was coming back. Yeah, that wasn't the experience that the spoiled war heroes had. No, then you're fighting guys with Air Jordans and stuff, like the pipe hitters from Chechnya and stuff that were coming in that were better equipped, better trained, and they wanted to get it, get it on with us. Let's just say that wasn't there in 03. No. More, more pigeons were killed in 03 than, you know. <laughs> The pigeons. <laughs> the pigeons in Birch and Hang are getting shot and everybody cheering. Were you? I, I think when we went moved into that Birch and Hangar, there was a, a piece of the metal roof. It was flapping in the wind. And yeah. There's like a hundred of us in there, the little bird pilots. Everybody's in there and the, the metal's banging in the wind. And I climbed up there. I'm assuming you did because you were another lead climber. Climbed up there and like tied it down with 550 cord to keep the. Oh, the shit. That's right. We were. We went to <laughs> uh, Colorado together on a trip. Did we it? did. No, we did uh, City of Rocks, Idaho, I think. That's when. That's I when, think you and I climbed Bastille together. Yeah. I just did that with my son, Jacob. Yeah, oh, about a year ago, he led the first pitch that sketchy pitch. Yeah, the, you fucker, you had me do that, and yeah. then Cosgrove <laughs> scurried up there in his fucking tennis shoes with and his, his little cigarette, and was just like, yeah, just put it right here. And I remember just like being frozen on the wall and just saying, "Please get the fuck away from me! You're freaking me out because you don't have a rope and you're in tennis shoes." Yeah, Gerby did that to me at City of Rocks. Uh, you know, eighty feet up, just all you see is right in front of you. You're just completely maxed out, just freaking out, shaking. And he comes up with nothing, yeah. tennis shoes, cigarette. Hey, put your foot here. Like, get the fuck away from me. Yeah, I don't, I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy that. I forgot we had done that trip. Didn't I take the climbing department over from you? Probably. Fuck. I guarantee it went downhill after that. <laughs> <laughs> PMS was not done on any, most equipment no. in there. No. Yeah, because we did underways and you and I were set up the goddamn hall systems. Mm -hmm. See? There you go. The stuff you forget. So much fun. Spoiled War Heroes in Spoiled 03. War Heroes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So the, it, I, God damn, I love my time there, but I had to go. I, there was no other choice. It wasn't going to work from a family perspective to go and do an, a 90-day ops tour. And I would have blown my brains out of absolute boredom. So. Yeah. No, I, I was the ops chief in 0... I guess nine or ten. It was when when Adam died. Yeah, and that was rewarding, but one of the most miserable jobs I ever did. 
dealing with that. What was the shitty part of it other than being detached in a purely administrative role? Well, you're that. I was burnt out. I did four tours as a team leader, which was probably too, too many. I was smoked. I was grumpy, angry. What were you smoked from? The repetition? Yeah, I think, well, so that was right after, you know, in 08, we lost Mike, Nate, and Louie. I was on those ops. I got injured from that. Just a raging alcoholic. Just a lot of death. I think when Mike, Nate, and Louie died, Badger died like two months before that. Um, blank How far the... apart did they die? Because Louie died from the explosion, right? And obviously Mike, Mike and Nate died from gunfire. Yeah, so it was it was February 4th, 2008, Super Bowl Sunday. It was, I'll never forget this. It was the, the year that the Patriots went undefeated. They're 16-0, and 0, went through the playoffs, and I hated the Patriots. And it was Super what? Bowl. How fucking dare you? <laughs> they used to have the most handsome man alive as their oh. quarterback. Yes. <laughs> but I wanted to watch a fucking game, you know, and, and those guys would play the little three card money every night. They do their nefarious shit during the day and then they would switch cars and jump through bushes and culverts and they would kind of try and lose us. And we were watching with ISR and I wanted to watch football. So I'm like, we don't know where they bed down. And the troop chief is like, yeah, we're going out tonight. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> so we split up. My team went north and then Travis's team was in the middle and then, um, Mike and Nate's team was just south, so we're spread out by about a kilometer, I think. And I initiated my call out, and it went kinetic immediately. Big gunfight. We got the house went up. I oh, they in, clacked it off. They clacked it off, and I got injured. I looked like Freddy Krueger, but it wasn't that bad, you know. It just yeah. looked horrible, but no big deal. What did they have in the house that they set off? He just had an S vest, but I was doing running the call out with the turf. I was a team leader, so okay. I was right by the door just behind a wall yeah which isn't going to give you too much no nah. so i looked horrible but it was not a big deal that went off and then travis's target went high and then mike and nate's went started getting pretty um sporty and uh so they were killed on february 4th and a bunch of guys got injured and we decided fuck it we're getting back on the horse we went out one more op i think two nights later um pretty sporty and then two nights after that so february 8th is when Louis was killed. The yeah. whole house exploded, three stories came down, killed him, and wiped out all of A team. Yeah, didn't kill didn't him. Travis all, but... got pretty fucked up too, right? Well, Travis is the funny one. So Travis was shoulder to shoulder with with Louis kneeling, and when the house came down, it crushed Louis, and Travis didn't get a scratch. But his whole team was just off to the right side of him along the wall, and the whole team just got buried in rubble. The dog, everybody, hips, femurs, faces, like guys got wrecked so louis is the only one that Fuck. died that night but the whole that's a course of like two weeks we're talking four days so mike mike and nate on the fourth and then louis on the eighth yeah with um multiple injuries so half the troop went home adam came out um, yeah that deployment and then was killed the, the following deployment i struggle with adam yeah I, I, it really bothers me that i didn't hold my ground when he was my student <laughs> in green team because I was his free fall instructor because he legitimately failed multiple times. Yeah, I remember he was joking to me one day about going to tandem school and I was I wasn't his TL but I'm like don't you dare <laughs> you'll die. I, I mean, he could he could jump fine. He couldn't see a fucking thing. Yeah, maybe one eye. Yeah. yeah, which was his right eye, which guess where you are as an AFF instructor on the fucking right side of your body. I'd be sitting there giving him corrections and he wouldn't move. He, and so then I realized I had to reach around, but he was, I'd have to, I, don't, I guess I don't know if I really ever have jumped out with like one eye open just to see if it would disorient me. But it was, I mean, let's just say, so I would go out as his primary instructor because Triple S was running the course. And for problem students, he'd be like, hey, Andy, we got one for you. <laughs> let's have some fun. Well, I enjoyed it. I liked the challenge. You know, I would let them go. I would let students jump out on their own and try to be confident in my skill level to catch them. So I would let Adam go. And he would fail. And I would report him as a failure. And he would be at the point, you know, you get a, a certain number. I think it was two attempts at every jump. And then actually, you know, he's on his third. And then he's on his fourth. And then a troop chief is jumping out with me. And then there's a troop chief and another troop chief jumping oh, out with me saying, hey, he's a good guy. Yeah, Let's give him another chance. And I, I fucking remember in that moment, it's like, yeah, okay, he is a good guy. And then, I, you know, I was actually overseas in uh, 2010 when he was killed. And it's just like, God damn it. You know, yeah. it could have, it could have been avoided. Fuck. So much could have been avoided. I don't know. I, that's one little instance in, in a million different opportunities. Yeah. But 
is that command screening for good guys or is it screening for people who are physically capable and competent? Yeah, I think back then that was a with Adam and Van Hoosier missing yeah. the leg as a CEO. I mean, there was a lot involved in that. And Adam was a special case when it yeah. came to that. And he was sure. a stud, by the way. For p- people yeah. listening or watching, I'm not trying to talk shit about Adam. He was amazing. I'm talking about my own. There's been a few instances in my life where I can look back on things like that where I, I knew I should have done more and I didn't. And then whether or not it was associated with that, the breadcrumbs later down the road, and it just sucks to <laughs> that, sit on that one. That deployment that he came out of when Mike and Nate and Louie died, so they sent us a bunch of guys. Like Evan came out and Lash and and Adam came out. And I remember we we're on target one night, and we're we're done, and we're getting ready to leave. And, and I'm standing next to Adam, and he's got the monocle, right? And I go, what's that like? And I do, Depth I would have worn a bino just to fuck with people, <laughs> but I would have like taken the tube out so you could have seen directly through it. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> but he, I was asking him like, "Is that weird? Is it hard to operate?" And depth perception. He goes, "No, it's not a big deal." And then the troop chief goes, "All right, we're out of here." So we, we take like three steps. He trips over a log. Boom! He didn't see it. <laughs> Sounds like, about right. That was pretty funny. But yeah, that guy was a fucking kook. He was so funny. So so much fun. Oh, he was a blast. You mentioned you. This is a conversation I've had with only a few people, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. You said you were burned out and probably did too, too many team leader deployments. Do you think it would be a good idea to limit people's exposure to combat? Because I know what the guys would say in the moment. Even if you knew you were burned out, you'd be like, fuck you. This is my yeah. time to be a team leader. Looking back now and the impact that it has had on your life or the people that we know that are – I think there's some – people that we mutually know that they have gone high and left in orbit in their post-military life. And I would associate some of that with the things that happened throughout the course of a career, specifically in our career path, exposure to combat. And you'd never be able to stop them from wanting to continue to experience that. But would it potentially save portions of their life later on if there was a limiting factor or a governor? I think so. I don't know how you would apply it. I don't know how you would. It would be basic math. Yeah. Well, I look at my experience. So the the first tour as a team leader, it was starting to ramp up. The second one was a blast. The third one was that one where it was. Uh, you have to define a blast because a blast to you and my and you and me might be different to what other people think is a blast. Well, you were saying how it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't all that exciting or kinetic earlier on, but Correct. you know, oh five, oh six, oh seven, it started picking up. So, you know, a ninety day deployment, we were going out sixty to seventy nights and encountering actual resistance Almost as opposed to dry holes oh or, yeah yeah well i would imagine the dry holes continue forever forever <laughs> but I, I think like by the third one that was the the suicide network so we were getting blown up every night we were yeah. you know it was it was dangerous and it was it was kinetic like very kinetic so that really got us um kind of like cats on the roof like clawing on there we were we were definitely uptight so by high the, stress level you mean high stress yeah so by, i think by the fourth time we just came off of basically every encounter we had it was a gunfight or an explosion so we kind of had to take a wrap off and try and throttle back which wasn't as easy because everything was a threat the deployment before and this one was less so 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 there was a lot of that uh, conflict i think internally yeah. um yeah and i was just fried it does weird shit to the geometry of your brain. And by then, I started drinking and a lot and just every day. I just want to sit in my recliner and drink home quietly alone or on the road. <laughs> or, or oh, yeah. No, I spent about 10 years hammered in my lazy boy. When did you notice the shift in him, <laughs> Jessica? And this, is, and this is the part where I think it's interesting because you and I could talk about our experiences forever. Like, I'm going to guess, without ever having asked you this, that you love being in combat. I loved it. Love me it. too. It made sense to me. It made sense. And I can't think of an environment that has higher consequences, but is more rewarding because you're literally toe to toe and you're going to figure out who's the fucking best at whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. It's- you mentioned it. it. You're you're winning, I think, out there. Like, yeah. so, so here today, if you're stuck in traffic and someone's being an asshole, there's nothing you're going to do about it. And then you go to get coffee. And and somebody bumps into you. You're ju- you're just you're just amongst normal day life without being able to do anything about it. I think, but <laughs> over there, you can do anything you need to to get the job done. And you're facing people that are equally as committed to what they believe. Very much so. Which is you know 
You're not going to find those people, I think, like where we just went and got coffee. No. <laughs> no, no. You but, might have an argument with somebody, but the breadth and depth of their commitment is probably not going to equal the breadth and depth of the commitment of what we were doing overseas. No, yeah. And you can go out every night and apply what you've been taught. and. So you noticed a shift in yourself. Uh, I was probably a year or two or three behind from the family aspect. What year would you say, like if you could, if I know this is broad, but if you were to flip back into a calendar, what year do you think you recognize the change in yourself? I'm trying to think when I first started seeing Bonby, it was shortly after John got shot um, and he was struggling. Johnny Reimer? Yeah. Okay. Deeply. He was struggling deeply. And I remember kind of going in and talking to the doc because I was sort of his liaison. I was helping him because I'm a good friend with him, um, notifying his family and, and just kind of keeping lines open. I wasn't doing a very good job of that either. But I went into the docs and I said, hey, I might know a friend that's having trouble. I know this guy. I know this guy. Hypothetically. I'm, I'm asking for a friend. Um, <laughs> which even I would say that's a great step for people as opposed to avoiding it oh yeah no and it was early i was probably i want to say i was one of the earlier guys that started sticking my toe in the pool with that and so what would that be late six early seven yeah because i think it was the deployment before mike and nate died um yeah so it was 607 okay was and that I, still a mandatory checkup from the neck up that wasn't time? even that didn't even happen yet. no that's before all that yeah did they institute that later on they, they made me do that uh, when I got back from getting shot, and I had one conversation with the psych or shrink. I don't know the difference. And he asked me to recall what had happened that night, and he, I was like, okay, this is what we were doing. I was on the ladder. I went to courtyard, waited for some people. Chip got wild. I got shot, and he was like, well, most people don't have that vivid of a memory of a traumatic event like that, so you're, you're, good. you're good. Stamp. See you later. No, I, I knew I was struggling – because we were, it was 90 days and you're back for 180. 180 and you're out again. It was just crank, crank, crank. And I think that was my, to my third and my fourth, I was feeling it. But I didn't notice the the family side by any means. And the drinking didn't, it didn't alarm me for years because whew, that's what we did. We Hard. were, we were great, <laughs> great big, in the kill home. house and we were even better at the bar, at the bottle. Which is hard to believe because we were pretty good in the kill house. <sighs> <laughs> Man. But the drinking. No, we would buy a barrel of bourbon and everybody would buy four or five bottles as as uh, things to memorize, memorialize a deployment by. It had the little placards. I would suck those things dry. Yeah. I don't have any of those left. I drank them all. When did you notice the difference, Jessica? I, I can say that I wasn't necessarily paying attention. Yeah. I wasn't looking for it because we didn't know. You know, as wives, we weren't, we're, we didn't know what we were looking for the, or that we were supposed to be paying attention to anything. So, you know, we have two kids and work and things are just trucking right along. Um, I, I guess I noticed subconsciously, but not necessarily was at the forefront of my mind until 2011, 12, maybe. And 10, how long have 10, you guys 12? been married? 21, 21 years. years. Okay, so you had been married. 99. We got married right before I went to Green Team. What, what, you went through 99. in 99? Okay, because I remember you were probably calling me a little shithead at Team 5 when I checked in. So I'm constantly in your footsteps a few years behind. Would you go 01 or 02? 02. Yeah. I remember the last trip I did to Team 5 was with Barklow taking you and Hoppy and... <laughs> probably and, Lewis. And Lewis. Yeah. Out to uh, Joshua Tree and you got... Yeah, oh, I have got, that picture that I posted not too long ago from that. We're all sitting on that rock. Yeah, climbing yep. climbing the rock at night in Redlands and stuff. That was a good time. Yeah, it was a good time. Okay, so you guys, so you were, and you had known each other before 99, obviously. We met in high school. Okay, so a good volume of time together. And I asked that because it get, you know kind of paints the picture for noticing the shift. Well, he had his what not to do relationship. And I had my what not to do you know, like, don't do that. Okay, don't do that for future reference. Um, and we didn't get together until, you know, 96. Okay. So. By what not to do? Are we talking about divorce? Mm -hmm. I'm Jessica 2.0. Yeah, I got he married five Jessica. days out of boot camp to another girl named Jessica <laughs> that I knew in high school. Yeah. And that lasted about 12 seconds. It ended up <laughs> five years later, we finally got divorced. But yeah, and then she was dating a guy and. 
And then, yeah, we came together at a friend's wedding back where we okay. grew up. And you know. But you still knew him. Oh, yeah. Pre-military, pre-selection, pre-combat, post. So in 10 and 11, you were saying, what did you, what did you notice first? Um, so, you know, in previous deployments, he would come home. It would take him a couple days. Like, he was a guest in our hotel or something, you know, and then he'd fall back into family and wrestling with the kids or we'd do things. Um, and then I noticed it would get to be three or four days it would take him and then it would take a, a week or two and then it would like and then that whole being home part kind of just glossed over like it took him so long to come back to being in the family that he was already getting ready to go again by the time he was kind of chilling out so the the length of time for acclimation just lengthened considerably yeah and I think it was our kids that noticed it before I did because they're a little more sensitive to that. But we were in the car driving somewhere and somebody said something funny and he laughed out loud. And one of the kids was like, Dad laughed. So I think they were kind of aware of it and on that level that intuitively that something yeah, was wrong. More They're so much better. than I would – care to admit my kids have seen and heard far far too much of uh my inadequacies and deficiencies uh, it's the uh, fucking sponges it doesn't surprise me actually that they have a better attenuator no i have very few regrets but yeah that my my family life for a lot of years was i wasn't a horrible human being but i was definitely checked out but yeah i remember that sitting in the truck and something happened and i actually laughed out loud and my kid looked at me like I had a dick grown out of my head. Like, <laughs> what is that? He was excited. Like, Dad's laughing, but I'm not used to that. And Did I noticed... you recognize in yourself that you were having a hard time reintegrating? Uh, oh, yeah. Were you trying to, or were you thinking about that next deployment? I don't know if I was trying to, or I just didn't know how. It just didn't compute. I didn't understand what effect that was having on my family. I remember neighbors would come by and like you make sure you come home to your family and 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 don't get hurt over there and i'm like whatever that's what i do i i got this and and i think the last deployment uh we had a neighbor come by and like kind of break down in tears like you come home be safe don't ditch your family and it really like wow what am i doing to these people yeah my mom my dad my siblings like i couldn't when i was when i would deploy i would never i wouldn't say never but basically never called home so three month deployment we would talk two three times maybe literally that that much i just couldn't do it i was focused i couldn't hear about the washing machine or the car or the kid or yeah i just couldn't so we we just separated and, and i don't think just kind of separated to where we didn't know each other anymore but i just couldn't deal when i was deployed and when i came home i was always thinking about the next time or what i just did and i didn't know enough to know that wasn't normal so I just kept trucking. Yeah, I think the lack of knowledge and education up front is a big problem. Well, it hits you in the ass at some point, you know. And I think for most people and for most families, it hits you at a point where it's probably it's already like at that tipping point of being unrecoverable. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons that uh, Jamie and I are finishing up a divorce but a lot of them stem from that time period and my career was fucking a fraction of yours but you don't deal with anything when you're not connecting right if, like, and i remember we would have arguments to this day in near you know 2020 2018 2019 we're arguing about shit from 2002 because <laughs> it never got opened it never got closed or opened it was just i called it a merry-go-round and fuck that's almost two decades ago but the reason it never got closed is because we, I, I, a lot of times, you know, it's hard to say. Like I, I wanted to be overseas. I was thinking about that constantly. I felt a sense of purpose and fulfillment overseas that I have yet to been able to replicate here in the U.S. And I actually got to the point where it's like, you know what? I'm not going to try to. I'm just going to let that go because that is what it was. And unless I go on it fucking shooting rampage which i'm not advocating nor do i think is a good idea it would be you know and this isn't where i want to do that but it's uh i remember the brief you're finishing up green team and you bring in i'm sitting there with like ob and all of our spouses from green team and the slideshow basically said 
shut the fuck up at all times. And don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. If people ask you questions, you tell them to shut the fuck up. And that's not helping anybody. And here, sign this with a golf pencil. Yeah, Jessica (laughs) signed her NDA with a pencil. I'm like, how legal is this? (laughs) Now, those are different times. Yeah, right? And so what are you supposed to, like, you know, I think back. Jamie never asked me about things that happened on deployment, nor do I think I would have talked much about it either. And my kids have never asked me either. They asked me very, like, four or five years apart. They're like, hey, dad, did this ever happen? Or like flying in a helicopter. I'm like, yes, I flew in a helicopter sometimes. <laughs> you know, like, but I'd never talked about it at home. Uh, I don't think my kids care or have any idea the type of things that we used to do, which is awesome. I, I could care less if they do or not. But it created a wedge that, I mean, I can speak from personal experience. It was irrecoverable. Uh, again, there was a lot of things that built on top of that, but that wedge was the root of the tree, I would say for sure. Well, we started out just you don't ask questions. And then as things evolved, you know, and the command just grew exponentially and things got so big and, you know, they're tier one VIPs now everywhere they go. Um, and it, but that just continued don't ask questions. So now this is fascinating because I've never asked questions and I don't ask the right questions either. So listening to him talk to other people is <laughs> the bomb for me because I actually learned some stuff that I've never heard before. I can't have these conversations with other people unless there's the shared experience because we're talking about the same people in the same place. Yeah, it's, I mean. No, I I knew it. I I was excited mainly to do this because I know my family will appreciate it. Jessica's already mentioned it. I know my my mom, my siblings, my kids, like uh, friends of mine are like, wow. Let's hear what you, people yeah. are going to hear me talk for however long this goes on. That'll be the longest they've ever heard me speak in my life. <laughs> I don't, I don't get into His it. And it's di- not that I don't, I'm uncomfortable talking about it. I just, I just don't think, I don't ooze this kind of stuff. But if you yeah. ask questions, I'm happy to. And I His knew. dad was the best at it. They, his dad asked the right questions all yeah. the time and just out of curiosity. And that's just how he was. And um, it was it was good to listen to those conversations, too. So I'm just like, what are you guys talking about? My dad has <laughs> said the same thing to me many times, like having just ex-military guys on. And we're talking about shared experiences. He's made the point to me many times that I've learned more about you listening to. Yeah. But and I don't, and to me, I don't try to not talk about it. I just it's not. I don't know. No, like right now, like the things that I, are exciting to me right now, I love dragging. I have, we have a dirt road up to our house, and I take my ATV, and I, I have a little drag behind it. <laughs> I spend an hour every day, and I drag my driveway, or I'll plow, or I'll shoot on the, the little archery range I made or something like that. That's what I want to talk about, or fishing or hunting or whatever. But Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a, a subject that isn't taboo. It's just that I share that subject with guys like you, and we went and yeah. did our thing, and that's a, kind of a separate I also feel like it's, one, it's generally not an appropriate conversation. No, I I had a conversation with my sister once, my sister and my mom, and (laughs) I can never forget her face. And she asked me, she goes, so have you killed people before? And I was like, "Uh, yeah. She goes, how many? I'm like, do you really want to know? And she's like, "Uh," like more than five? And I'm like, yeah. And I could see the blood drain out of her yeah. face. And she looked at me like I was kind of a different creature. And it, it broke my heart. I don't think she was happy she asked that question. And we moved on from it. It didn't stay weird. But I remember yeah. seeing that reaction in her face like, oh, this is my brother, my big brother. Well, and love. how do you relay that um, type of conversation? So you're at a dinner party, right? And people are like, oh, what did you do today? And you're like, he doesn't. Dude. He doesn't do dinner parties, so it's fine. That'll never True. come up. But see, here's the thing. I avoid them as well. <laughs> and I also don't want to talk about anything because it, people, I don't know how many times I've been asked that question. People are like, oh, so what's it like to kill somebody? And I've had a couple times where I'm like, it's fucking awesome. And they're just like, <laughs> ah. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, hold on. I need to sit you down for 30 minutes and explain what I'm talking about. Because I'm talking about, again, like we were saying, somebody who is equally as motivated, like you're engaging with somebody, you're going to, it's like the most ridiculous competition, crucible, testing ground, and you win. Yeah, And in t- doing so, you're fighting for what you believe in and you're trying to erase an evil ideology off the face of the planet. So yes, it's awesome. And yeah. hopefully some of the blood comes back into your face because obviously you think I'm a psychopath yeah. and that's, 
It's like, you know what? I'm never saying anything again. No, but think about it. Like if you're a police officer that trained and never arrested anybody or never did your job, or if you're a, a doctor and never innovated somebody, like this is what I'm trained to do, and yes, I got to do it, and I'm pretty good at it, and so yeah. are my buddies. So, yeah, it's it's a matter of you're excited that you innovated your first patient or you're excited that you innovated your Fifth Haji's <laughs> fucking face with your, yeah. You know, I don't know. It's one of those things. It, yeah, it's, it's simple, I think. But those conversations, the appropriateness of those is not over like the shrimp appetizer where people are just slowly just pushing their <laughs> Okay, that's uh check, please. Check. This got awkward, yeah. It does get awkward. And, but it, it's weird, though, because how long were you in the military? 27 years. How old are you now? 47, 48, 47. Almost 48. <laughs> I don't know. You were in the military longer than you've been out of it. Oh, yeah. And you have the vast majority of your adult life things that you don't feel like you can discuss with other people because it's not like, you know what I mean? It doesn't compute. It's nonlinear to their experience. So that puts you in a weird spot because I think there's a ton of value in sitting down and talking about shit. It's been (sighs) unbelievable to me how cathartic it has been. So cool. To just sit down and have people and just listen. Like, oh my God, I did experience that or I did feel that. People, you know, the things that bother people that, that don't bother others. It's been hugely powerful. Are you familiar with O2X? At a very peripheral level. So so Adam and Paul, they started this company, and, and we actually work for it, and we run these workshops um, for firefighters and police and stuff. And, and the curriculum is injury prevention, strength conditioning, mental health, nutrition, sleep. They, they holistic get, approach, holistic if you will. Holistic approach. It's great. And a big piece of it is the mental wellness of it. And, uh, and I... I don't teach a lot of the classes. Most of the classes are taught by doctors, specialists, and stuff. But I, I introduce each one, and, and I talk about how it tied my job into the subject and how it benefited me. But the mental health piece is, is one that I've kind of built a brief, and I talk about Mike Nate Louie. I talk about Extortion 17. And I talk about what it did to myself, my family, my marriage, my kids. And, uh, and it is hard. I still get nervous and sweaty. Um, but each time I feel better doing it. And it's such yeah. it's such a healing aspect of what I do now is to get up there. I don't want to talk about it. It doesn't feel good talking about it. Which um, I think speaks to the importance of actually doing so. It's huge. Like when it gets to the point where it's just wrote for you and it's easy, you got to go write a different brief and write it about something that makes you feel that way again. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to do and – but it feels good. And I'm not going to lie. I, I knew we were going to go down this rabbit hole um, here, and I haven't been coping very well. I've been sweaty and nervous and uncomfortable. And I know it's just you, and yeah. I, I trust we're going to have a, a comfortable conversation. But I knew there's, the there's going to be <laughs> uncomfortable <laughs> pieces to it. And I've been kind of thinking about it. Like, so all I've been thinking about for the last few days is Mike, Nate, and Louie, Extortion 17, and Adam, and, and all the stuff, and the drinking, and the marriage. Are those the, the things marriage. that make you the most uncomfortable? Like when you say, you know, you get shaky or you get uh, clammy hands, what what is it that makes you feel that way? Because 27 years in the military, I'm assuming not all 27 years of that makes you feel that way. It sounds to me like there's some very specific thing. I think it's a there's a byproduct to it, and it's less about the overseas stuff and more about the the, the distance that I gave myself between me and the family, um, the, 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 the struggle I think I had at home, just, just being checked out for years and years. Um, yeah, I think those are the pieces of it. Those How are... many of the guys do you think that we were working with that were struggling with the same amount of stuff? Eight out of 10, at least. Yeah. Eight and 10. Uh, yeah, I got to the point where I, I think I was the first one like in my troop or my team, that it was openly talking about going to therapy because I knew it was helpful. And then more and more guys started doing it. And then you, and then you come around to where, like, all right, I know most of the guys are seeking help to some degree, but a couple aren't. And those are the ones that I worried about more than anything. It's I'm not, not worried about people who tell me, hey, I need help. I actually have no concern for them. Like suicidal type stuff, people are like, hey, I'm thinking about killing myself. I'm like, okay, that we can do something with. The guy who's like, yep, I'm fine. It doesn't say shit. That's the person that I'm worried about. The, oh, yeah. Like the no explanation. Did they change it at the command where mental health became something that they were? Oh, yeah. There's probably four, maybe five docs. Was it mandatory or just promoted as if a 
you know, maybe you guys should take a look at this. They did the thing, the checkup from the neck up, that was a mandatory thing. So it gave you had a 15 minute window. You basically signed up. I'm going to take two to two fifteen on Wednesday, hmm. and you could either go in and stare at the the dock for fifteen <laughs> minutes, or you can. I've done that before. Or you can spend six <laughs> hours. Um, you know I, what? What really helped with that is that the dock started deploying with these guys, and and I don't know who started it. The bonfire. I think it was George. Um, or but, the non formal or hanging. Session. They would hang out at the bonfire and just hang out. And and that made all the guys a lot more comfortable. And I mean, otherwise, it's just some weird new doc that comes in and says, tell me about your childhood or your feelings <laughs> or whatever. And they're like, where have you been? You haven't been here. You don't know me. And yeah. so I think they really worked very hard. Bonby and jo- and the other guys George, yeah. um, tried really hard to just be local. Um, and that helped a lot. And then Shumi came on board and she was just such an amazing human. Yeah, Shumi um, saved my life. Yeah. I don't now, know who that is. Shumi, well, yeah, and I'll get into that. But like, so Bonvi was the first doc I spoke to, and he's the one I kind of stuck my head in. Hey, I've got this friend who might have an issue, and he's like, "Come on in." He was great, and he left the command, and I didn't want to start over again. Um, yeah, it's a lot, right? I mean, I see a counselor every week for just oh. working through the divorce, and oh, yeah. it is fuck. I feel palpably different on the days that I can sit down and just unload, even if, even if he's just sitting there. And sometimes I can tell he's just like. And then then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm good. Hope you're good. See you next week. And it's like, I feel great. And then you leave and he takes his earplugs out. (laughs) I think I'm driving him to drink more than likely. So (laughs) probably. Well, when when Bonvi left, I think the next deployment, um, Mike, Nate, and Louie died. And I called back to the command because I knew the the help that he had given me. He'd he'd already left. But I said, you need to send somebody out here and not have clinical time, but come hang out at the fire drink of the guys and just be and george came out and he lost his mind with us you know but yeah. guys liked him and 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 i think that was helpful um, but starting over so i after bonvi left the command i didn't really want to engage again it's was, tough to rebuild that it's relationship it's it's, especially if you explain and do the work for months or years leading up to what it is is going on and then has somebody hi how's it going jason i'm andy i'll be your therapist and tell me everything Oh yeah, no. So it went from Bonby and then and then Shumi, who was, she was a, in the military. She was a wife of a one of the EOD guys, and she was a friend of ours. And she kept kind of poking me like, "Hey, you probably should talk to somebody." I'm like I'm fine, and I sure as fuck wasn't going to talk to Shumi because Shumi was a teammate's wife. Like, no way am I going to dump this thing to to, yeah. to her. And after extortion, she kind of just walked up to me one day. Hey, idiot! Meet me in my office. <laughs> We're going to talk about this. And yeah, Shumi's the, she saved my life with that. We, we spent, I don't know, a couple hours every week for years after that. And she just helped me through tons. And Jessica and I sat down with her and Jessica sat down separately with her and the kids got to talk to her and just, wow. So the commands came a long way. They have four to five. Um, there was the mandatory checkup from the neck up. You take for what it was worth. Um, yeah. But, but at least it opened the doors to, to the guys. That's one thing that. <clears throat> I was, you know, right when I was going through the medical or in 2012, I started going through the MEB, PEB process for medical discharge. Hmm. And they have you go talk to a psych, again, a psych or a shrink. I lose track of which one does what. But it was one of the first times in the Navy, other than when I got shot. And they're like, hey, you need to go talk to this person. Hmm. And they actually had an office that was like kind of nearby, kind of close to the compound. And it was still a pain in the ass, and you could avoid it. And I went there, and I was like, yes, I'm fine, blah, 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 blah. But having them there with you, having them forward deployed overseas, like that to me is the is the the jump, the catastrophic leap to what I think can actually help the guys. Yeah, and I don't know how much therapy was going on overseas at the fire. But I they were. Just, I think a lot. I think just talking about stuff – to somebody who's not going to judge you? Yeah, I guess my, my point is, is that I don't know how much clinical, like, actual conversations they were having about that. He was just kind of one of the boys. They were there during the deployment, during those night after night after night. So when it came time to coming back, the guy's like, oh, I know George. I know Joe. I yeah, know Jimmy. A I, trusted party. I'm going to go into their office. I'm going to walk up to the son of ops, go up those stairs and go down the hallway and make that left. And everybody knows what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm comfortable <laughs> with it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where they stuff them with the Son of Ops building? Yeah. Sons of bitches. Sons of bitches. <laughs> That's actually where I talked to that shrink, too, <laughs> when I got back. 
They probably just ended up taking over the whole second floor. They're, yeah, they're, they they're moved. Grown. Remember, Shumi moved down past the um, fire department. Well, they have that as well. So they've got the sites on base, and then they have like an offsite. So you can either the family can go there, um, or you can go there if you don't want your buddy seeing you walk into the office. And the commands come a long way. I think the whole community has. Yeah, I'd love to see it at a point where. There's never a thought of, oh, man, I don't want my buddies to see me go into this building. It'd be you're walking by as you're making entry and guys like, hey, dude, what's up? Right on, man. Like, you know what I mean? It's celebrated as opposed to. I think it's there. I think if there's any um, if there's any stigma attached to it, it's based like if I looked at you and, oh, shit, Andy's going in there. That stigma is mine and mine alone. It's not a command yep. thing. It's it's not a hurting thing. When, when I was a troop chief. The guys that went, it was it was right on. The guys that didn't go, those are the ones I was concerned about. So I think it's flipped quite a bit. I hope so. I think the command's take on alcohol, it would be a big move to, to kind of shift things because... What you, is their current take? Well, you, you yard it in, <laughs> right? Fuck that evolution. I, God so you damn begin it, that your, was rough. You begin your time there... Alcohol well, is this thing honest. we do. They right. built the a team room. The history of the Navy is not steeped in alcoholism. <laughs> of course not. Or, course not. wait a minute. <laughs> well, you are in, and then you boot out. So, so. Uh, and then there's a bar do- in the team room. Like, they have their own fancy place. We well, should describe yarding in. I don't know if I've ever talked about that. <laughs> yarding in. And y- so, yarding in, there's a, I'm sure everybody's seen them at bars. They have those yard long glasses. Three footer. And and each squadron had a different one. Like gray had a seven beer yard, and gold had a four and a half, and blue had a you know each one's like our yard has more. Of course. But even if you had the smaller yard, there's assholes in there that are putting nine shots of Jack Daniels at the ball at the bottom. But then Nate, Nate Hardy, you ended up dying. He he got the boot, he got the glass boot. So you yard in and then you boot out when you leave. So and that thing's fuck, even more beer. I don't know. Yeah, it was nuts. They say once it, you have to give a toast. Once this touches your lips, it can't come off of your lips. I watch people throwing up into it and drink their own vomit. Oh, yeah. Well, you know it's bad when the standard is they give you this thing to drink out of, and then they put the big garbage can right, right next, next to you. To vomit into it. Yeah. So you, yeah. So you don't mess up the team room, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We did uh, – I yarded in at uh, – god damn it. He had a cage next to me. He ended up shooting another seal. What the hell is his name? Casper. Yes. I yarded into Casper's house. <laughs> yeah. I probably was there. You were there. I'm sure, yeah. Yes. I remember doing that. Yeah. Um, Which, yeah. Ugh. But yeah, it started off. And then I used to hear legendary stories of the Blue Squadron Christmas parties. They got shut down because I believe they fucking destroyed their entire team room one evening. Yeah, I remember the first Christmas party... So it was the next, it was the 2000 green team because they went into yard in and it was violent. I remember going down there to see what was going on. Spent about 20 minutes and went, this isn't safe. And I left. <laughs> no, because they were, safe. no, some guy got mad at the, 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 the prank on him because they would give you those gifts. But in Blue Squadron, they would. He got a dildo headed golf club and he swung it across the alcohol containers and apparently detonated them across Broke everything. Broke them all, yeah. Yeah, and then I heard that beers were being thrown at each other's groins. It full. was bad. Yeah, it was, which then they ended up in the computer monitors. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, I support it. Yeah, no, Blue Squadron was a legendary. They had the most epic. <laughs> it's the Jessica's biggest like, fraternity. children. <laughs> Such a frat house. It was bad. Well, it was better than a frat house because we had fully automatic weapons. Yes. <laughs> you couldn't drink until they were all locked up. Which you could unlock them with your badge. But it's not like it really mattered. <laughs> No, yeah, no. Early on, and that around that same time, I remember the Blue Squadron party. But those are that was pre nine eleven. My team leader, or my boat crew leader back then, I, I wasn't. I'm not a. I wasn't a partier. I didn't mingle. I wasn't like hanging out with the guys. I wasn't part of the frat house so much, so I didn't fit in as well. But I remember my boat crew leader telling me, "You basically need to stay around after work every day, drink with the boys, drive home, not get a DUI. That's how you'll fit in here." That was the culture. That was kind of... I would agree 100% with that. I was told that by my leadership. Basically, yeah. you need to hang out, drink more, drive home, not get a DUI. And even if you weren't told that, you could feel it. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, it, it, again, the kill house that we spent, even, in my, again, my limited time there in the original Gold Squadron team room with the, the bar, right? And it'd be like in the kill house, and then, okay, we're going to have beers. Lamps lit. Lamps. Ex- fuck. That is exactly <laughs> correct. Yeah, the Lamps lamp lit. is lit. Are the radios turned in? Are the guns put away? Lamp yeah. is lit. The lamp is lit. And you would stay there, 
sometimes far too long. Fortunately, I lived in Red Mill. So Working. Dry. Yeah. Working. We were, it was more <laughs> of a debrief. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't a... I mean, yeah, it was it was a boondog. It was a shit show, and it was fun for everybody. But as a young guy, it wasn't a choice. It wasn't really. And if you weren't there, if you weren't at the table, you were on the menu. Yeah, yeah, you know? interesting. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I felt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, and I think that, but again, that was the culture. Was that written down anywhere? No. Did they say DUIs are bad? Yes. Did they say don't drink and drive? Yes. Did you drink and drive every day? Every day. Yes. <laughs> every day. But then I think the ARIs started catching up. Which stands for alcohol-related yes. incident, the fastest way out of the military in the current era. So yeah. in 2006, I started working as a probation officer for the city. And every morning, we would get the jail roster. You're like, blue, blue, red, yeah. gold. <laughs> yeah, so she'd I would call like, him. Oh, there's three more dudes on the on the list over the weekend. And but FYI, guys if you're well. looking for this guy, he's in the jail right now. So. <laughs> Which that probably sucked because he was just like, okay, I'll go radio silent for 24 hours. I'm going to get away with this. I'll hire a lawyer. I will not tell the command and I'll be fine. So if you're the one or seven that were uh, arrested for DUI or alcohol related things and uh, you don't know how the command found out, it was me. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy looking back on that time too. the mental health stuff. I think it makes us better at the job. (sighs) Light years. And that's the thing. So you actually would have been more lethal the more help you sought after, but it had a stigma associated with it for most people. You know what I mean? It's like this really negative feedback loop where actually if they embraced it, it would, I think, put the squadrons or the teams light years ahead of what they were capable of doing. Yeah. Yeah. You really, I think you missed out a lot of it. I I want to say that's not an issue at all anymore the mental health which is awesome I can't even tell you how happy I am to hear that because I truly believe that if I mean fuck the reality is the true weapon system that we had was between our ears yeah and if you cloud that you know you're going to degrade your performance on target the cleaner that you can get that the better off it would be now there's there's an interesting I think that the war picking up guys going out to deep end um, a lot of guys like you and Johnny that that were just sort of hung out to dry I'm sure there's you know wives like Jamie, John's wife were just like, what is happening? I'm getting no support. And yeah. and so I think a lot of that trickled out down. Um, that was a big help. Uh, and I'm glad that those systems were fixed. And if I had to, or my family had to experience that again to get those systems built, I would still go through that. I mean, it sucked to go through, but the fact that it was corrected, that's really all I care about. I think we were guinea pigs for a lot of different... I think the country had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. No, no. I mean, do you remember OIF-1? They're like, we got to get it in. It's going to be over. Or even same in Afghanistan. Did you Did you ever think? Because I came, they surged us at a You did the Karzi thing. For I like came 30 days. And all I did was just fuck people up at Madden football or like uh, Grand Theft Auto. Well, our boat crew was was like tasked over to Blue to help with Karzai. Yeah. And I remember being so mad because the squadron went on and went after UBL one night. And I was stuck in Kabul on the cars I detail, and I was seething. We all were. It was almost a mutiny. Like Gold Squadron almost imploded because <laughs> we missed the big mish. Yeah, it was a second op. I mean, I've done hundreds. I know hundreds. How many times have you gone after UBL? At least 150. <laughs> I explain that to people too. They're like, "Dude, were you there?" That I'm like, "You don't understand." That night would happen three times a month. But when it was the second one, we were so mad that we missed yeah. it. Hindsight, like, well, what were our panties in a bunch for? But, well, imagine the. I even remember my first deployment with gold to Afghanistan, and it's like, okay, like I don't know how long we're going to be coming here, and that was in like oh four, oh three, seventeen years ago, <laughs> and it's like holy shit. A few more times. Well, that's a, like, you know, my history of the command actually before OIF and OEF. What were they? What was I remember? There was some. Uh, they weren't plaques. It was like models in the gold squadron. Was Bosnia. It Bo- yes. Which wasn't that basically you'd shove somebody into a car? <laughs> yeah. They, they, they'd kind of tag somebody. They'd find out where he lives. There'd yeah. be a block and force up the road and a van would come in. Three guys would get out. And some, then some little that, skinny Bosnian or Serbian dude would walk out. They'd throw a hood over them and throw them in the van and off they'd go. And that was amazing. And that amazing. was it, right? For the command before. I mean, what had the command been involved with kinetically before Bosnia? Uh, Panama, Grenada. A little bit, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe somebody 
80 to 40 mic mic round in a helicopter. Not a big deal. We don't need to say names. No, no, <laughs> might have happened. Might not have. Thankfully, there's an arming radius. <laughs> <laughs> 40 mic mic. Bounces up and bloodies your nose, but that's about it. Yeah, into a fuel bladder, no big deal. Helicopters are not precise instruments that require tens of thousands of parts to be in synchronicity for them to actually fly. When those things get wobbly, though, it's not fun. No. But that's like, so the, you know, the country, I don't think had any idea. And the command yeah. evolved even in my short time there. Well, think about it. when we showed up, Afghanistan. When we I were getting got ready to, Gold to go, Squadron, was... you guys had just gotten back from the first Gold Squadron deployment to Afghanistan. But we were learning. We used to wear our body armor, then our soft armor, 12 mags, all this stuff. 12 mags. Get Red Squadron. Some. Went, Red Squadron went over there. <laughs> they landed at 10,000 feet to do some off. I think they went 50 yards and realized. And died. They called back and said, <laughs> get rid of three quarters of what you're wearing yeah. immediately. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was an evolution. So. With, I mean, the tactics changed. I mean, think about the combat clearance, right? Oh. Think about the shit we were doing until Mike and Nate died. Let's run into every room for, and let's not ask why we are. So crashes and dirt rooms. Yeah, it and helps with visibility though and breathing. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like so much had changed. So much had changed. I I always describe it as when we started the war, we thought we were the best ever. And then we quickly realized we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we were still very capable, but we we had to adjust rapidly. And then it became um, before the enemy kind of started figuring out what we were doing. And we're yeah. almost like bullies, and not in a mean sense, but it was just like we could do no wrong. We you could power through the battlefield. You could crush those guys. And then yeah. they started adjusting, and then we started getting our noses bloodied. And then we had to make some more adjustments. And then it became a game of chess later on where I was like, all right, they're doing this. We're going to try that. They're doing that. We're going to try this. Yeah. They're adjusting. We're adjusting. Yeah. And the mental health aspect and the growth or the support for the families. And again, so we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. Guess who else didn't? That well, <laughs> you well, wouldn't like, be the only one. Because I mean, do you think I was talking with any of this stuff <clears throat> with Jamie? None. And I was like, no. None. It, no, Jessica was, I, I almost want to say she was one of the kind of the pioneers at the command because we had an ombudsman, but it was sort of like a because the Navy needed one. Yeah, it was, so it was like have a historical one. Navy thing. So she was like, well, people were kind of asking her, maybe you should do it. So she's like, what do you think about an ombudsman? And I go, well, I don't. I was going to be the ops chief when she was going to be the ombudsman. I'm like, well, I don't want to have to work with you directly. Like church and state, I want to come home and not bitch about the opso or the fucking whatever. That would be a rough setup. It was. Because the bottom line is you'd have to recognize that she outranked you. Absolutely. She's <laughs> talking to the boss. <laughs> but she came in and started seeing, like, because she's always done her own thing. Like, I'm doing my thing. She had her own thing. And she didn't rely on me to come home and fulfill her life. She was doing search and rescue. Or... Which, by the way, I think is actually critical. Absolutely. Talking we about wouldn't my... be married if no, I had no. to rely on him. I don't think him. many people yeah. are if you were relying, and that can even go to like, you know, fulfillment. Let's add happiness to that. You know, like it's, if you're relying on that for somebody else, that's a long-term recipe for disaster in my opinion. I've come home and, and she's just like, hey, on Tuesday, we're going to so-and-so's house. You can come if you want, but I'm doing this. Or on Sunday, we're going to this, the beach to whatever. You can come if you want. But she had her thing, which was good. Thank God. Yeah. But when she became the ombudsman, she was watching me just detach. So she's like, well, I'm going to have some fun with this and try and help the wives out. So <laughs> she was doing some interesting things and she was getting money from like the Navy SEAL Foundation to help. They would, you know, at first it was like, let's have a bowling night. She's like, fuck it, man. We're all like young, fired up women. Let's have, let's learn how to dance on a stripper pole. And she submitted that. They said the no, by the way. They said, said no. The CEO. <laughs> but she tried, she was just like, the, hey, let's have C some fun. The CEO told me, hey, get together with this person, um, you know, and and do some fun wives things and they'll give you money for it. So I the thought that The bowling alley isn't a fun yeah. thing for the wives. Um, but I, I got called, I got yelled at for that. I remember that because the foundation was like, we're not going to give you money to go to a stripper class. <laughs> <laughs> and all the guys like, are like, this is awesome. Why not? It's and the wives stretching. were like, we would you just got to repackage that. Amazing. We would get the studio privately. We could bring, you know, bottles of wine if we wanted and learn this fun thing and get together. And it sounded wholesome at the time, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they said, no, <clears throat> we did manage to, to get together and do it on our own. Yeah. So what year did you become the ombudsman? I think, 
I don't remember. Um, when did so it was like 2006 to 2009 or something? She was, it was at, like three she years. was there for like so Mike. Yeah. That's where I left. Okay, <clears throat> Mike, Nate, and Louis. She was the ombudsman for that. You were the ombudsman as I was leaving because I left the command in late 06, and you had already checked on as the ombudsman. And so obviously, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Again, <laughs> nobody knew what they were doing Sorry. in 2006. I'm curious as to your experience with the wives. Well, I don't think there had been ombudsmen before that. So I had no one to learn from. Um, you you know, the and first they, squadron of mm-hmm. ombudsmen. Yeah. Yeah, because before yeah. that, didn't we just have like the little laminated phone tree? That was always incorrect. Call. It was 100% it was always incorrect. There was always one number. Yeah. Or that drove her, yeah, get her going on the fucking phone tree <laughs> and why it was never accurate. It drives her crazy. Yeah. <laughs> or the pager system. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> no, but she took the ombudsman and then Badger died in Vakaba. And then uh, that kid died at, at Mid-South. And then Mike, Nate, Louie. And then at... Mike and Nate, one of their funerals, Tommy Valentine died. His wife was notified on Valentine's Day about her husband. And then Lance Vaccaro died. Like, I remember on the phone with her, one of the few times we did speak while I was deployed. And she never showed chinks in her armor, but she was, like, broken up and just going, please stop doing this to us. Like, no more. Because it was, like, six guys in a month and a half, two months. Just yeah. boom, 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 boom. I don't even remember what my kids were doing that whole couple months. I think that deployment, um, my kid survived on things that he knew how to make, like PB, <laughs> PB&J, scrambled eggs. And, um, and I, I would like yeah. look around and be like, where are my kids? Like they, um, they probably said, I'm going here, or I'm going there, but I don't remember because I was so streamlined focused on losing my mind. So, How was that experience being, I mean, I'm assuming you were probably involved in the notification of next of kin or somewhere very no they um they offered um like nate's wife was was absolutely not i don't want to talk to anybody really fuck off um so and that's fine that's you get what you want you know um you're gonna get a mixed bag for sure but they offer like so the you know keiko goes and does their thing and then you know if you're friends with that person it's a lot easier to have that connection but if they don't know you you offer like here i'm doing this thing um but we like our garage the one time he he, so he does word working and all of his tools are always in the garage there was never parking in the garage and i think he had cleared so you know i know gym equipment and other cool right i know i'm okay with that (laughs) (laughs) it was in the prenup it's fine (laughs) But it was the one deployment where he had cleared a space for me to park. And that was the deployment that our garage was full of, like, toilet paper and baskets of, like, food and whatever paper necessities. Place, yeah, stuff just stuff people. that people had donated to the families that needed distribution or whatever. So we did some behind-the-scenes stuff like that. Uh, but I just imagine it was probably a lot more personal because you were tied into the command at a deeper level. This is how much interaction Jamie had with the command. Zero. So, Well, you know. I mean, it is kind of true and with that command that um, the squeaky wheel does get, you know, a little more attention. So, you know, there are a few of us that were squeakier than others. Yeah. Um, that did hopefully create pathways where change occurred. And, you know, I don't know if it was all our, our spousal doing, but the command eventually did see need and we had meetings about it and resiliency and focus. Um, I don't know if you ever heard that focus uh, stood for something overcoming obstacles of some sort. It was a family resiliency um, families overcoming under stress or something like that. Um, But they offered some help assistance, counseling, stuff like that for free. And then it just kind of progressed into then we could see the command psychs, whereas before it was just for these guys, wives and families were on their own for their mental health needs. Yeah. Um, And then it became more cohesive. And then there were retreats and, you know. Now, the other thing with the with the psychs is, you know, I could go in for months on end every week and sit down with Shumi and she could relate. But maybe her and I couldn't relate. But then we could sit down with Shumi, and Shumi wouldn't pick a side. But when she was frustrated about something, she could tell Shumi that. And Shumi would say, okay, well, this is what your husband's going through. Yeah. And she could put it out in English that she would understand. This, is, So she would understand what I'm going through better. And it was just it was super helpful. An objective mediator kind of. 
I describe it as there's a neutral third party that, like you said, has to uh, take the dialect from one person. And They're an interpreter, it yeah. To the other. Because I would say, this is what I mean. <laughs> and then that person would say, this is what he means. And they yeah. go, oh, oh, I get it now. I'm like, I've been saying that forever. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> nope. No, those are those are helpful. Do we, you we understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> Good God! Yeah, yeah but you have to all want to be there. If he didn't want to be there, it You're wouldn't have been nowhere. successful. So the only reason we're sitting here next to each other and don't hate each other is that he was willing. When I said, "I need this," if you want to stay with me, if we want to be married still, this we need to do this thing. And so if he hadn't been willing to do that. It wouldn't happen. To me, again, it goes back to the lethality. Supporting the families, having a network where you don't have to worry about it overseas, where you know that they're taken care of. Guess what you just did to the warfighter? Sharpen, little shave. It's like, fuck. Even after extortion, which was a shit show, and I'm sure we'll get into that, but that was one. The one thing that I felt good about was that the command halted everything and just dealt with that i had heard and from a very far distance i got notified of that through the news like i mean i was completely detached but i heard that the command did a phenomenal job yeah. of putting together basically what would be a crisis center they were they were really good at it at that point they were good that, and, but they that's had to a do it sad truth. Truth. they had some practice yeah yeah they had a huge conference room that had all these tables with laptops set up, and there was a Keiko team for each family. There was a room that they had reserved for donations and supplies. Uh, it was it was amazing. And it wasn't even the you know whatever the number ended up being, but because some families were split, like you had the wife who didn't like the parents, and but the parents were divorced and they hate each other. So you had like three Keiko teams for one guy. <sighs> So and talk, Keiko stands for Casualty Assistance Call Officer? I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. I have no clue. It's it, it's essentially, though, for people I listening. I can Google it real quick. <laughs> it's, it's the person responsible for notification of direct, uh, next of kin. Yeah, I think it's a Casualty Assistance Call Officer. It's not the job you want. No. It was a tertiary duty for, like, uh, Team 3 the, on my deployment in 2010. There was a helicopter crash. And the OPSO had like the tertiary duty of being a Keiko, not the call you want to get. You're red. It, some people were like, say, hey, uh, you're going to be Keiko for this. Or if you were good friends with that yeah. person or the family or something, they tried to kind of group it like that. But yeah, they like, wanted me to Keiko never... for, for Kelly when Adam died. And I was just like, absolutely not. And I came up with some excuse like, well, I'm the ops chief. I'm going to have to deal with her day to day. I don't want to have that stigma of me, the one that told her about her husband, and I was just pussing out. I had 100%. to... I didn't want to deal with it. When the Hilo went down and Brendan died, a bunch of the guys from his platoon were already back in the States. I had to call him into the team and notify him of who it was. It was fucking rough. Not, not, a, not anything I'd ever want to do, because they're all sitting in a room. I'm like, hey, guys, I need you to all sit in here and not leave, and I can't tell you why, which is an indication of what has happened. The only thing that they didn't know was who it was and that now the, sucked the hardest the three hardest leadership experiences i ever had came in about i don't know four or five hour period and it was extortion i was the troop chief i'm in a jock when the helicopter gets shot down we're trying to figure out is everybody on it like there's two birds is that so you were de you were still at gold and deployed yeah i was, was, troop chief. Okay. I was on the phone with lou you who were was, the other troop chief i was the other yeah. troop chief so i was on the phone with lou langless who was the troop chief on yep. that bird we were talking about going into the Konar in a week or so, like, hey, we may need to divide and conquer up here. Um, and he goes, fuck, that sounds great. Hey, I got to go. Something just popped. See you fuck later, buddy. Little. That sounds great. Let's just go up to Konar. Yeah, let's True go. plus. <laughs> so he's like, I, I got to go. Fuck yeah. We'll talk later. And uh, yeah. Because they so. got popped for QRF, right? Which QRF. Is quick reaction force, meaning somebody basically dials 911 overseas and says, hey, we need help. Yeah, so the Rangers were in a tick, I think, and, and some guys squirted off. So Lou's troop got spun up um, based on the terrain and, and, and the, the threat and the loom. I, I don't remember what, all the details, but they all ended up hopping on one helicopter. It was a DS bird, direct support bird. Uh, it wasn't 160th. So I don't remember what the mitigating forces were or why they did that, but they all jumped into one bird. Which is abnormal. Very abnormal. But there was reasons for it. Um, they get shot down. And now as Scotty, who was a CMC, and me are sitting down looking at Manifest going, 
shit were they all on bird turns out they were well i heard so and so might have been he was sick with the stomach flu maybe so and so didn't get a bird no he fucking threw on his kit and went on so and so might not have either he might have went out with the rangers no he was on the bird so the whole troop gets on the bird gets shot down so i had to walk out and tell my troop one all your friends are dead which was it was fucking horrific right yeah. and uh and then in almost in the same breath um now guys are jocking up to go retrieve and and it was kind of two for me one i didn't want them to see that but two mainly i didn't want to see that so they didn't want to see it either they didn't and i said we're not doing it we'll let the rangers go recover the bodies because it was it was fucking horrific right and and i just didn't have the the nuts and i didn't want my guys to to have that arrest their mind because they're going to go up and know who they're looking at and it, it yeah. just burned in their their minds forever so i had to do those two things and then kind of turn around like hey we still need to keep operating but we can't go out and just do the village like you want to they guys wanted to get their jihad on and and I go, we go out one night and do the village. It might feel good that one night, but we're getting shut down. We're not helping the battle space. So, yeah, and, and one evening I had to tell them, all their friends are dead. We're not going to go help them, and we can't go do the village for a bunch of reasons. And that was, yeah, it was fucking horrific. That's a lot. A lot, yeah. For sure. It seems like some pretty good foresight, though, in the face of all that trauma. You're still thinking about you don't want guys to see this, which is... Yeah, I don't know. Call. They would have been. I mean, I, it yeah. just takes a. It's pretty good maturity, I think, to be I able to know. see I, that while you're in that mindset. It felt selfish at the time. No, we had to go. You know, it's the right call though, because if you would have, if you would have sent them, they would have had an emotional attachment to that event greater than what they were already going to. Like, it's not like you're just going to forget about that in a week. No. But if they had to go hike out with their <clears> friends <throat> or deal, from what I heard, the wreckage was horrendous. Well, the next night or two nights later, we're at their fob. Basically, I went into Lou's room. I had to pack up Lou's room. Yeah. Horrendous. We had to sift through their gear, which was burned and melted and charred and just trash. Like, that alone was that was fucking horrible. Yeah. But, yeah, I kind of And then you going, still have a job to do. Yeah. We and like you had, said, you go off the res one time with a high level of scrutiny. Some shit gets captured on ISR. It's over. Not only is it over, but some people might be wearing some handcuffs. Yeah. You know, absolutely. depending on how bad it goes. Yeah, leadership is a bitch, but I mean, it gets tested in those moments just like that. I, I mean, now the guys, the guys did great. I mean, I think they were, I mean, everybody was wrecked, gutted. Um, the, I didn't get a lot of pushback on. I think some guys were upset with me for not going to retrieve the bodies that we didn't go do that. But I think they got over it. Um, we were fucking hammered every night. You know, we were broke general order number one and and drank quite a bit. But we we rallied up as a troop, um, and uh, the guys. They performed admirably for the rest of the deployment. They they were professionals. They they didn't lose yeah. it and and just get their jihad on. Uh, I, I was I was super proud of them. But imagine I mean, somebody in your role that would have gone the other direction and stands up and gives them a fiery speech about how they are going to get their jihad on. Imagine how far that could have gone in the other direction. Well, then it's not Absent. work. Then it's just revenge. I'm going to say something that may not be correct. <laughs> I support revenge sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe in forgiveness, but there is a step in between, and that's fucking revenge. All right? That's my personal opinion. I'm not saying it's correct, but... Well, we can get revenge on the assholes that did it. But correct. Just, yeah. it's, uh, but it's tough when you're that emotionally attached to not, you know, you can just connect, I think, in between your ears some dots that may not be there and justify an action under revenge, and the person that you took that action on has nothing to do with what happens. So... Yeah. Yeah, I think that besides, uh, I'm, I'm overstating this, the, the casualties of extortion were the, the biggest loss. But on a funny side note, the, the only other casualty of that deployment was the bar in Jalalabad where we stayed because we drank every single night. Sykes were coming, people from JSOC coming in to see how we're doing. And we're just like, woo, hammered playing cornhole <laughs> and still sobering up, going out and doing our job every night. But yeah, but yeah after that, I think they, they cut the uh, Jalalabad bar down with the chainsaw and that, burned that, it to the ground burned it to ground that was never happened again so that was that was my fault so apologies <laughs> to all those guys that didn't have a a bar there <laughs> i never <laughs> spent much time up in jbad i went through a couple times jbad and abad but not a lot of time up there i think we I don't know, one of the last times i was in afghanistan we was like a turnover op it's i 
was, remember I was the number one man on the door. I chose to take off my body armor because we inserted so high. I was wearing assless chaps. And your butter bars? No, dude. No, that was in 2010. This was like, uh, oh. Oh, it was back when you were in the squadron. Yeah, we fucking hiked all night long. It was a complete and utter dry hole because they heard us hours before. But I had slid down rocks so much on my ass that I was basically in assless chaps standing in front of a door with no body armor on thinking in my head, what the fuck kind of life decisions did I make that led me to this point? <laughs> what am I doing? Here? And Rapes is like behind me. He gives me a squeeze. I'm like, I don't want to go into this room at all. <laughs> I've never felt so naked in my life. I'm like, where are my plates? This is terrible. And why is there a breeze on my ass? This is just... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's that 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 whole shedding the plates for weight in the altitude has bitten a few guys in the ass, man. It's gotten a couple guys killed. Yeah, fortunately, that's a tough one. And again, that's one where you know maybe leadership could have stepped in and said, "Hey, like this isn't this is no longer optional." No, I, I know I've heard aside stories about guys that have made those decisions and it worked out, and other guys that it didn't. But I remember. I got to a point where there was no side plates and a little chicken plate in the back, and he would kind of joke about, oh, my kid only weighs 23 pounds or something, my body armor. Yeah. but, but Which is basically like what it was like in OIF-1 when I'm sure there was 23 yeah. pounds for one pouch. For one pouch. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to look at my little side plates like, God, do I really want to weigh this? Like a little pound. Yeah. And then I'm like, I'm an asshole. If I get shot and this, I'm not wearing this. She's going to fucking kick my ass. I only wore the side plates a few times, but I remember I slipped them in the night before I got shot. Ah. And it w wouldn't have mattered. I didn't uh, I didn't get shot inside, obviously. but It might have, though. You put the plates in. You make a left instead of a right. Yeah, it was great. So the second it. round, I'll show you the belt tonight at my house. The, yes. the, the belt I was wearing has about six inches of burn mark from the second round. And then the copper jacket of the AK round is like molded to the belt. So it spun me towards the person shooting, and then the second round traveled down my belt and passed <laughs> without hitting me. Yeah, there's some weird ones like that. Guys, yeah. guys have holes Rounds in the pouches. Radios, or yeah. who's that guy? He was at he was a Team Five guy, and he I want to say his name was like the Clerk or something. He got shot in the head. Chris the Clerk. He was my first platoon OIC. He was at Team Five. In his skull, but it like traveled around the skull and was lodged like it was a ricochet. I believe it went up. Uh, hit the ground, hit him in the safest place ever, which is his head for him. <laughs> <laughs> DQ's awesome. He was actually, when I got commissioned, he was the one who did the ceremony. Oh, nice. Went, yeah. But it skipped down and came up. And yeah, I guess they basically, the corpsman was like moving it around. It was like, popped it out. It was popped like, it out. It just traveled along. Yeah. You guys get lucky, man. Don't you have a picture of like the inside of a helicopter? Oh, he was in the other hell. He was oh, in the oh, helicopter fuck. where the guy got shot in the head. That's a funny story. We talked about that in a minute. But that's not funny. I was like, that's my favorite jacket that got ruined. The funniest thing <laughs> was me and you in the laundromat like the next day when you fucking just like fuck this and you just hucked your jacket. <laughs> you were in the laundromat. <laughs> He's trying to wash his puff jacket out that's soaked in blood. And Jessica, won't... my favorite puff jacket. Yeah. And Andy's trying I to hear you. he's I trying hear you. to rinse the blood out of it that he it was used to stop the bleeding in a crew chief's head. I think it was a crew chief or the ranger. Yeah, it was crew chief. And in the next day, you're just like you're rinsing and rinsing. And you're like fuck this thing, and you just kind of like as Pat Tillman like, doing fucking wind sprints in the sand outside of the tent. <laughs> it's like what? Yep. Yeah, I remember I had I put it in a wash cycle and I flipped open the top. It was a top loaded washer, and I looked down and it was fruit punch. And I'm like. <laughs> And I did it again, and it's and then I finally, yeah, I basically football spiked it into a garbage can. I was pissed. Pissed. That yeah. guy lived. Yeah, I'm sure he's maybe slightly personality wise a touch different, but he lived, which that, is unbelievable. That deployment epitomizes every like every shit show of an op I went on happened on that deployment. It was there's so many just stupid comedy shows. That same op, the one, first op we did, the number one chem bio target in Iraq was a greenhouse. Or was a school green, or something. It was a school. Yeah. And I lost my nods on that target. <laughs> but I realized that they were missing, so I wouldn't found them. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Rapier running around with like a fucking quickie saw on his back, which actually that wouldn't be incredibly atypical for, for Bill. He probably has a quickie saw on right now. Right now. He's skiing with a quickie saw. He probably back. is. <laughs> but I remember it was like, the, what was it, a four-hour helicopter ride in? Getting shot at. Yeah. Getting shot at. And then I remember the helicopter ride back because we had a Terp with us and he refused to sit down. He stood there and just shook the whole time because he was so fucked up. From what <laughs> no, that whole lot, like Mop 4 before we uh, land, running through the firefight and Mop 4 can't see. One of the 
one of the guys on the squadron, when the guy got shot in the head, it was he, an EOD guy. He fell back and he got tangled in like the the cords. Yeah, and didn't get off the bird. So now our head count screwed up. It was a it was a shit show. And then did we flatten through. that glass? Uh, whatever that they wanted us to take the soil sample where the fucking tomato plant was growing. <laughs> you remember the briefs we were getting before when we were in this fucking gold squadron room in the team room, and they're like, "Look at this tube. It connects to this building. This is definitely the Cambai." And we get there, it's like it's a greenhouse, Jessica. <laughs> it was. It was a greenhouse. There was plants growing in the greenhouse, and they're like soil sample. I'm like, do you want a tomato too? Like, here, you, like, <laughs> and then I'm pretty sure we put a satchel charge next to that thing and Probably. just vaporize yeah. it. I remember standing there, minute out or whatever, two minutes out. Yeah, that's when we started getting fucking shot at. Well, right before that, <laughs> the A10s. I think it was A10s. Shot out. They the nuked power the power grid. grid. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, this is so cool! Like big fireball! Like look at this!" And then I realized the fireball is making a giant silhouette of us, which we were landing and, in front of. And then you see the skirmish line of guys just light us up. It, it was insane. And then the little bird pilots were flying around and like they're up there, like, "Oh, I've had enough with my M4. Hand me that saw." And they're just mowing people. They're having a good old time. Yeah, and, and we, I'm like. <laughs> I can't oh. see, breathe, do anything. I ripped my mask off <laughs> immediately after making entry to that building because I would have rather died from sarin gas. My eyeballs were touching the lenses of that fucking gas mask. I was sucking that thing That's to my worst. face. And I had a blower on, so we had these high-speed blowers, no. which my weapon sling was over the hose because why not? Because, yeah, just just an abortion, <laughs> an abortion. That was target one. Target two was just clinch. Which one was the – when did we do the the big palace by the – Oh, Lake Thar-Thar? Lake, was that three? That was three. Yeah. That's when the mini gunners basically went Winchester on empty towers, and we ran amok. Well, we landed. Uh, the Rangers get out, and they, I think back then, this is early, before taxes, Rangers have come a long way, as have we. <laughs> but they're basically, they were a blocking force to these towers. So they get out, and they're like, blocking force, we're going to block some force. And they get out and just start unloading. Dude, the 47 I was on was... I was on the starboard side of it, the right hand side. That dude was just going back and forth between three to five thousand, just all over the tower. But we hit the deck thinking it's Armageddon, and it yeah. was nothing, nothing. It was Armageddon of the dead, stricken. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that was three, and then we surged to Baghdad and lived in bird shit hangars. How crazy was that though? When we took off from RR, flew into Baghdad, low level. Almost killed a guy, get his head smashed by some vehicle in the bird. Yep. We were doing this map of the earth shit. And then we land, and it's full-blown war zone. Mortar, rocket, Artillery, bombs. seriously, like mortar. You could hear him just... Doosh, doosh, doosh. Middle of the night, the bird lands. The crew is like, get the fuck out! We run <laughs> off the bird. It whips around, takes off. It's like the first or second C-130, I think, that landed at a biop. And we're standing there, and it's just war all around us. And I was like, this is for real. We're doing this. this and is somehow legit. we had stolen... The CAG guys panders. They That's made right. It. We got to do our, we did the lynch op with the panders. With the CAG guys' fancy trucks. Yes. That was an, a total abortion, too. That thank, was you abortion. For, thank you for Wikipediaing that for me. I understand about half of what you guys are saying, but I'm I, trying I, to. I, like, no, it's okay. It. I'm it's trying okay. to spit out the acronyms, yeah. And he's doing a pander was like a. A fancy truck. I get it. It's a That's big, fine. yeah, big armored thing, but yeah, that was an abortion op, too. That it was. That was a fucking complete joke. And it then, was cool, but it was a joke. It was cool. And then, you know, as soon as we got her out of there, we were clearing the basement and all that stuff. People were just, I don't, I don't know, that whole thing, man. It was really cool to sit down with her and talk about it from her perspective. What a trip. It was crazy. That she had never been. talked to anybody who was there that night Love from me. our side of the house. It was unbelievable. She showed up with her daughter. We sat down like we're doing right now and just fu- rapped about it for a few hours. It was That's fucking great. awesome. That's great. Yeah. She's doing well. That is cool. Yeah, that was. A, I remember standing at the. I was on like the first little bird to land at the target, right in the front door, and the yep. whole building was glass. So you're basically staring at yourself. Right before we took off, do you I remember re- the brief they gave us? It could be fifteen to five hundred fedayeen. Oh, fedayeen, and we're like, awesome. We got twenty seven people on these birds. Let's giddy up. Let's get some. <laughs> Yeah, I remember the little bird pilot going, "Man, we're gonna make somebody's dad a happy man tonight if this goes well." And I yeah. was like, "Wow, no shit!" And then, and I leaned over, about ready to take off, and I go, "So once we start flying, when are we kind of in the bad guy land?" He goes, "About ten feet off the ground." Like yeah. basically immediately. I'm like, oh, okay. Ten minute flight. 
the, we were flying across. There's a big, the Marines are on the on the river are shooting, right? Yeah, and there was strobes going off. They were marking their positions. It was a shit show. And then the pilot sticks his hand out, gives me the one minute call. I reached down to undo my lanyard from the bird. It and wasn't, it was, wasn't. wasn't cooked up at all. <laughs> and then we land in front of the big mirror and Gasper again. He's the primary breacher. I'm going to be like the one man into the building. Yep. And it's chained and... And I'm just staring at an image of myself thinking there's 500 bad guys in here. Just like, fucking hurry, Ron. Let's go. Yeah. Get it in. And yeah, the rest was history. Yeah. Literally. It's interesting how they spun that one, too. How they made like a Hollywood movie out of it. And I don't know. So they... we watched that and he fell asleep. <laughs> they did the documentary. <laughs> yeah. Stuff on the you know what's crazy? Though, is I wonder who drove that. Why did they make a documentary out of it? Why spin it into something other than it was? Like we accepted the risk going in there with. I mean, we we launched with the information that we had. We were, if we would have encountered the 15 to 500, we would have been drastically undermatched or oh. overmatched. But why make it seem as if something, you know what I mean? It's fucking cool enough as it is. Well, no, it wasn't. It It ended up being a big photo op, kind of, right? PR, like, basically. Wasn't she, a, she was able to be kind of freed like a few days before. And they, they tried turned her to, around. I believe they drove her around in an ambulance trying to get her back to American forces, but... What the Fed Union had been doing was also staging attacks out of ambulances. Oh. So they basically just chose a poor vehicle to put her in. Gotcha. Yeah. But I think there was, yeah, I mean, we didn't encounter any resistance on the inside. No, there was a lot of shooting, but it was just us. Yeah, shotgunning doors. Well, yeah, I mean, we had like rangers out there and they were mm -hmm. fucking getting it on. That's what rangers do. They get it on. They were getting it on. <laughs> I watched a ranger one time do at least a 15-round burst into a paper bag that was going across the street. He was fucking hitting it, though, I bet. I was just like, I just was like, dude, I support it. That's like, you put all 15 rounds into that bag. I'm like, if you, and like, that's a different level of get some. I mean, <laughs> I don't know why that bag scared you to the degree that you just did that, but I'm not, I support it. Feel free to shoot <laughs> any paper bags that come out while I'm in this building, please. Yeah, fuck. The Rangers, those guys are awesome. Like, well, we, we hooked up with the Tillmans out on that deployment. Yep. I remember the coolest workout I ever saw was... Two of the biggest human beings I've ever seen, both Rangers, UDT shorts or something. I don't know. I'm imagining this. Maybe it's my <laughs> homosexual side or something. That just just shorts, tennis shoes, and they were taking a pallet of MRE boxes that was nine feet tall, boxes of weight, 50 pounds a piece or something, and running it like 300 yards to another pallet. And that was their PT, like carrying the big box over to the air and back and forth, back and forth. Like, I've That's stayed in touch some. with uh, Kevin Tillman. He actually came up to visit for four or five days. It was not last year, but the year before. I would love to sit down and pick his brain, but it's not at that point yet. What a fucking story that was. Ooh. We're just dealing with those guys. I remember they would run over like, hey, what are we doing? What do you mean? Like, well, they said we're going to get out of the back of our Bradley and point our guns this way. All right. Like, oh, we're actually going after this guy, and we're going here and there. Yeah. They would come here to us for intel. Yeah, like what's actually those, going on? They wouldn't tell those guys what we were doing. Yeah. Jessica, what was your experience like when we were off gallivanting around the world having the time of our life? Thinking we were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was more like knowing we were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I did all the other things that you need to maintain your life as a human. Literally <laughs> everything else. She still does it, that, but everything else. I, have, I just have to, I mean, I, I was going to say I'd have to imagine, but I don't think I can imagine what it's like being on the other side of that coin. People say like, and it, I know people mean well, but when it's just so fucking irritating and they're like, I don't know how you do it or how do you do it? And you're like, what are the other options? Like, I didn't realize there was a multiple choice here. You just do. You don't get as much sleep as normal people. <laughs> you drink more than normal people. Uh, and you, I, it's in front of you and you just do it. Whatever comes next is in front of you and you do that and it, and so on and so forth. So you just do. I don't know. Yeah, until you get to the point where you don't. I got a small taste of it after when Chris got hurt. He lost his finger. A friend of mine, he was he was in and he got out and he became a, a, a case officer and was doing the, the Afghani stuff. And he got hurt. And I, this is after I'm done. I'm not deploying anymore. And he's near and dear friend. He's like a, a little brother to me. I've known him since he was a little kid. And, and he got hurt overseas. And that fucked me up. It rattled me in a weird way that, I, you know, 
we got hurt all the time and it's just like oh, fucking Andy got shot dumbass ha 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 um, fuck you it wasn't fun <laughs> well, I got fucked up too yeah, yeah. it's just kind of like yeah you're, you got you're slow but when he got hurt it was it it kind of rocked me in a way that I hadn't felt before and, it, and I'm like oh my god this is what it's like sort of a teeny 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 bit of it yeah and this is one one instance they dealt with it I what 15 deployments or something like, I was gonna ask you uh, how many 15 deployments over how many years did you spend there almost 18 years Fuck, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a few too many. Well, it's just, I'm trying to, I'm just thinking of any other military occupation that would let you stay at one duty station for almost two decades across any service. No. It's, Can you think of anything that even approximates that? I think for most people, four years, maybe you could eke out six, but three times that at one place. Can you think of anywhere in the military where, other than CAG? Or, uh, you know, other some other JSOC units? No. No, and I don't even think, like, in, in CAG, I, and I think the Army does such a good job of this, is they're, they're great with their professional development. They make you leave and go do some leadership Joint thing stuff, yeah. And come back, and they, you have to go to the school. Like, they're better about it. So, no. It was weird. When I, when I left, time to PCS. Permanent I, change of station for those listening. Yes. So yeah, I'm working on it. Just you knew that one. Though. I didn't know that one. I didn't know. That one. But you're moving cross country, <laughs> and here harder. I am. I'm a master chief at a command, and they're saying, "All right, you need a PCS." I'm like, "Okay, how? <laughs> what do you mean, how? Like, well, what do I do? Oh, well, you got to go on this thing, and I had to have people hold my hand through all this process. Well, plus I, he I, had to do it because I had a concussion at the time. How yeah. did you get a concussion? I ran into our friend deck. Jeff um, on a bike, a road bike. Yeah, it was ducks. This is a funny story if you want to hear it. I do want to hear it. <laughs> Were there any ducks injured in the telling of the story? No, of course okay. not. That's not how oh, I that's roll. how the injury occurred, didn't it? You were attempting to not hurt the duck. <laughs> so uh, my friend and I, we were going to do this um, Face of America. Um, it was like a 50-mile bike ride in D.C. from like, uh, I don't know. I don't know where to where. I don't remember. Um so we're training with Jeff, who is a biker, and he rode bikes all the time, and we're taking pointers, and I got a bike, and I got shoes that click in and everything. Uh, so we're, we're riding in Pungo, which is like no cars, country roads, flat, nothing there. It's also nothing, known where Travis lives. Nothing happens there, right? <laughs> yeah. So we're riding along. Um, Jeff's like, we're doing good, and I'm working on um, going behind him, like drafting off of him like getting really close so i'm trying to maintain this distance so all i'm looking at is his tire i see nothing else and all of a sudden he swerves so i swerve and follow him but i keep going and he does not Ooh. so i just ran smack into him so that was in april i think um so i didn't get to do this race um my friend Teresa did and um i was able to ride on the bus with the disabled um caregivers and stuff because it was like a not disabled, but um, adaptive ride. Um, so people had like the three wheels and the arm bikes, and it was all very cool. So I got to hang out with some guy's service dog while he did the race, <laughs> and I'm in a sling. So um, Meanwhile, Jason's trying to figure out how to PCS. Yeah. Right, right. So Imagine I was concussed yeah. from that, and he's busy trying to figure it out. And it's online now because when we did it the first time in 99, yeah, PCS, it was different. I PCS twice in 27 years. And that's where I was going to go. Imagine being in – so a Master Chief is an E-9, the highest enlisted rank you can go. There is no E-10 people, so it's okay. To that was my people. motto like the last couple of years. Yeah. It's which... okay to not be a douche when you're <laughs> a Master e Chief because <laughs> you made it to the top. Fuck. Um, they can't fire you at that point. You just, like They can't not promote you. But imagine you. how many PS PCS moves. Again, I'm tr I just – I have never heard of 18 years at a single command because to become a master chief, let's say in the fleet, which both of us know almost nothing about, but you probably would have to PCS five, six, seven, eight times. You'd be, oh, you'd yeah. be at the point where you could actually mentor people through the process to yeah. get to the point where you're a master chief. No, but you have like an E4 yeoman, like, <laughs> what do you mean you don't know how? Like, just looking at me like a weirdo, like laughing at me, like master chief doesn't know what he's doing here. I'm like, I've never done it. I did it one time in 1999. Yeah, and it was different to go to Green Team. Yeah. It was on paper orders as opposed to whatever digital system existed. Yeah, and I don't even remember how we did that. I, yeah, just kind of. So what did your so how did your progression go? You went ninety nine Green Team, up to Gold, and then Team Leader. No, you assistant Team Leader first, then Black, 
I went to black for a little while when I was burnt. And then, yeah, I came back and I did a, I did a deployment as a two IC. And then about halfway through the deployment, old scoop, he was hurt. He was still, um, kind of rehabbing. I think he was a little messed up from when you got shot that same yeah, night. He, got shot he was my TL night. and he went home early. Um, were, and I, were you a, a E6 or E7 at this point? Oh no, I'm an E7. I was an E6. Okay. Yeah. Must have been. No, 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 no. That's right, because I made chief while I was in black. I, yeah, I, was gonna, I was trying to figure out the rank structure and progression. I made chief when I was in black. Yeah, because I remember making it when I was in Africa during Katrina, whenever, 2012 or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I took over the TL for that, and then I did that deployment. I did three more, then ops chief, then troop chief. Troop chief as a master chief. No, I, so I did, I did that deployment. After I took over from Scoop, I did three more deployments as a TL, all just boom, 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 like in the heyday of yep. get, of getting it on. And then I did an Ops Chief deployment, and I think somewhere in there I made E9 or E E8. Yep. And then I took a troop, and my first cycle as a troop chief, I was a an E8, and then I made E9. And then at that point, they had turned the uh, squadrons into individual commands, right? So the rank structure was a little different. Yeah, they did. They did that. Back when I was in Blackguard, kind of shortly after you probably left. I just I just remember it allowed people to stay. I think that might have been one of the reasons you could stay as long as you did, because it was meeting those career wickets. Yeah. Because it, especially for the like the uh, O's, XOCO, Billets, CMC, Troop Chief, all that stuff. Yeah. Because otherwise, I think you would have had to have left the command or gone through the rotation, like from squadron to black, back to the squadron. So you stayed a gold the whole time? Whole time. That's what I'm talking about. He's yeah, like the I only on one, I think, right? Huh? You're the only like the only one. You're like the unicorn. Well, if you look at like there's been a lot of guys that did, you know, fifteen to twenty years there, but most of them, that whole like drinking and driving and not getting in trouble kind of a thing, most of those guys left for a year or six months or I wonder why they did Yeah, that. they had to take why like why did they have to leave Jason? Yeah. <laughs> So I, there was a time there where I think I had one of the longer 10 years there, just yeah. nonstop. Um, what was your favorite tour while you were there, rank-wise, I should say, or position-wise? <sighs> so many good ones, man. I, I, I loved I loved being a Nug. That was fun. But I, I really wasn't plugged in. I was just, all right, I'm going to go do my, my job. So I was sort of – I wasn't really locked in. I was just having a good time. TL was – Unreal, because you know, and I did so many of them. I, I got tired of that. Troop chief was great. I I think the most rewarding was running green team. That was my. I did that for three years. What years did you do that? The last three I was there from like thirteen to sixteen, seventeen. The most rewarding tour of duty that I had was as a buds instructor, which I never would have guessed. But yeah, it was yeah, so yeah. cool to be able to metaphorically put your hand into the soup awesome. and change the recipe. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was, it was stressful from a leadership down on me from the HQ. They wanted more bodies and you had to kind of push back. We're not making more. Um, yeah. From the guys below us, like we want to fucking fire, fire everybody kind of a thing. And, and then just being in with great team around you, um, collaborating with the, with the Sykes and this, um, the HP guys and uh, just all the people at the command to help make screening weeks better. They're Seeing using, a guy, they're using software now for selection and training that he helped develop. See, they don't even call it Green Team anymore, do they? I don't know, everybody still calls it Green Team. I don't. Know, it's well, it's it's S and T. It's, it's right? Step. Step. Well, the, all of training there is called Step. Oh fuck! Everybody that I've ever worked for that I worked for. As a master chief, and Steph is going to hate me for not knowing it. <laughs> Forgetting the random Se acronym. Selection training, training something. Enhanced and performance. performance. Or, I, fuck, I don't know. Yeah, so that was that was amazing. But the, my favorite part was like telling a guy, "All right, you're going to gold," and then off he goes. And then the next week, his hair is a foot longer. He's got all the gear, a big grin. He's like, "This is awesome. It was worth every fucking shitty moment of green team." It was. It was. <laughs> it was awesome. It was I, a good day of the day. I got to go up to the second deck. Because remember, I'd see you occasionally when I was in green team. You'd be like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, you were in that weird little, like, 
Were you in a green team where they were still kind of dicking around with, are you going to gray or are you going they to... They didn't tell us until we were in Marana. So we did a week of... Sh- or not a week. A month of Shaw's where the class got smaller. <laughs> I still remember my first house run at Shaw's. Fucking Aaron Baldwin gets up and he draws... You know, there's the room the, on the house on the left, which I could still draw out to scale right now. I could clear that damn house with my eyes closed probably. I know, I could too. It's insane. <laughs> it's got that center-fed hallway. Yeah. So that first room with the center-fed door, and it goes straight down the hallway. There's three doors on the left, three on the right, and branches, and it goes Dude, down both no. sides. <laughs> and I haven't been there in 15 years, but I can still <laughs> tell you that. Aaron Baldwin gets up with Jody, and they draw on the board. This is how you do a two-man entry. This is this person's responsibility at the door. This is this person's. Go lock and load your pistols. First two guys get ready. And I went and I shot every fucking target that was in the room. And then I went, as I was sweeping back, I was like, oh my God, where those shoot targets? I was so amped out of my goddamn mind. Yeah, Yeah, your first run in the kill house and your first time doing a tandem. Oh, fuck, yeah. The tandem passenger jumps didn't bother me. The first time I was ever strapped to a barrel, I seriously reconsidered my life choices that led me to a place where I was attached to a refrigerator getting ready to push it out of an airplane. Just one of those things. That you think that there's some sort of logical buildup, and it's no, like, see this big heavy thing the size of this table? Like, put it on your tiny 178-pound frame. And Give it a push. Get... Like, yeah. What? Wait, what? So we went, to Sh- we went to Shaw's, month of CQB, whatever the fuck they were calling it back then. Went to Marana, month of jumping. Last day in Marana of instruction. They get up, and they say, We're going to break your heart. Well, they say, how do you want to receive this information? (laughs) Do you want us to list the names that are going to assaults or do you want us to list the names that are going to boats? So it's a matter of, do you want to hear a lit, you know, and then they asked the whole class and it was the, the answer that they got was give us the names of people going to boats. And they did it alphabetically by last name. And you could see people just like, fuck, 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 fuck. And then we went out and had a party that night. And people were Some celebrated for, for reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but man, it was, yeah, there was no, and I remember when I was at my interview to go to the command, they, it was like the fuck with you question. Like, oh, well, would you still come if you could only go to boats? And the answer of course was yes. I'll do anything. I'll, and that's what I said. I'm like, I really don't care. I just want to come to this command. And they're like, okay, moving on. I remember I was a, a first Lieutenant guy, which is, I was in charge of the outboard motors and the boats at team five. Yeah. And I was afraid that since I had experience, that that would send me to grade team. And I, like, expunged it from record. I didn't want to talk <laughs> about it in the interview that, that I knew anything about outboard motors, which wouldn't have mattered. But, yeah. but yeah, that was crazy. And because they, I never actually saw the process at the – they you know, they said that there was a draft, but I think they basically just part and parceled records to each of the squadrons given the vacancy. You might know more about that having run green team. Well, yeah, now it's – now it's uh, – it's a draft. So basically the squadrons get about the same amount of guys. There may be an extreme situation, you know, like extortion example where uh, yeah. the squadron's hurt and they need more bodies. But it's basically last year red got it, so this year blue is going to get it. And they, they, get get, first, they literally get to pick first? First pick. And then the next year it'll be gold and the next year it'll be – What are they, What criteria are they looking at to make the pick? I mean, are, are there objective metrics? They're looking at a guy's shooting ability or is it just – No, it's, it's pretty – it's basically feedback from the cadre okay. from the second deck, like, hey, this is how the class ranked out from one to twenty. It's the best guy, and this is the twenty guy. But you know, I've heard guy. you talk about it. Your honor man was a fucking murderer. In buds, he was yes. One of the best guy, I think, in the first class, the thirteen class I went through. He's he's right now being charged with murder for that uh, green bray over in Africa. No shit. Is that how that's finally resolving itself? Because that's been relatively quiet. I think I just read that another guy who I didn't know is getting a year in prison for his part in it. But the guy, the main guy who I put through green team, I think he was top two or three in the class. I think he was number two or three. He's an absolute stud. It's going to jail for murder. I'm assuming. I I have... I don't want to call him a murderer. I have no fucking clue really what went down. No one ever really will, I don't think. And that's coach, why there's due process. Yeah, they yeah. They can so, figure that shit out. So I don't know what happened. I just know that's what's happening to him. He's getting ready to pay the man or get exonerated. But what was the highlight of your career? If you had to pick one, there's a, there's an op that stands out that was just frogman cool. <laughs> Let's hear it. It was yeah. it was the deployment. 
This is probably right right before I started tumbling down the rabbit hole too. I can kind of put this whole deployment on when I started losing a little bit, but it was like the last op of the deployment. I was a new team leader. I'd just taken it over from Scoop. It's called Objective Nitro. Evan was on it with me. Travis. I got asked this question the other day and I didn't know the answer to it. Where the fuck do we get the names for these operations? Is there a random name generator? I think they pick a because I remember doing it one time, like, all right, the we're gonna go with president names or we're gonna go with I remember it's, band it's like names, whoever like, picks the hurricane names or something. Yeah, I remember there was a cycle where it was cars, where the pro words were all cars. Then there was bands. Yeah, they'll pick a subject and okay. then you pick names from it. Okay, I think. and I don't know where. Yeah, I really don't know. But there's some I don't know funny either. fucking things. Yeah, I remember doing one. It was it was it was Dalton, and we hit like nine thousand dry holes. So it was Dalton twenty seven, <laughs> Dalton twenty eight. Like goddamn, I'm sick of Dalton. <laughs> No, but Nitro was, I was just taken over as a TL, and uh, Lash had just got hurt. He got sent, he got blown up and sent home. So uh, Scotty came over, took his team, Mog was the other team leader, and then me. And it was these bad guys were going to have a meeting on the Euphrates River, and we were going to go wrap them up. What we saw is we were letting the target develop that evening. We saw a bunch of them get in boats and motor to this island on the Euphrates. And... Uh, and it's like, fuck, we need to go out to that island. Maybe we could, how are we going to get there? We're going to fast rope. Can't, can't swim there or anything. And I'm like, fuck, my, my team's doing it. So I was going to take the recce team and my team. And we landed off offset three or four K, patrolled to the river. The other two teams hit this target where the meeting was supposed to take place, ended up being a dry hole. And we stole like three sampans. <laughs> Full kit. There's, I think there was nine of us. Yeah, three per boat. We cut the little locks, paddled these boats that basically sunk as we got to the island. So we got up rivers, coasted them down, got to the island, climbed this rock wall, got them in an L. We didn't really know where they were. It was super thick, and we just creeped and creeped and creeped and creeped. And I remember seeing them. I'm like, fuck, we got them. Were was, they just sitting out there in the open? They were sleeping. It was nighttime. There was like 10 of them. There was more of them than us. They probably assumed that they were safe being on the island. They were totally. They were, yep. they were lined up, sleeping, all kitted, the whole nine yards. And we creeped up. And I remember looking over to, he was, I think it might have been Travis. I'm like, there they are. And he's like, where? I'm like, look. And, they, and sure enough, the one guy sticks his head up. And they're like, whoa. They realized something was going on. They kind of shook their buddy. And we just owned them. And, and we there's four or five of us on the line, and we yeah. started lighting them up. And then as they started kind of getting their shit together, the three recce guys are just like, no, sir. Yeah. And they just... Just classic L ambush. We fucked those guys up. So there was more of them than us, and we... You're not going to survive being inside a complex ambush. No. Like, you forgot, like, you forgot the part where you, like, planned ahead and took an oar, like, from the boxes. Yes, so sorry. <laughs> I we had Connex stuff. boxes in... We were in Al Assad with Zodiacs in them. We had Zodiacs, motors, a whole nine yards for contingency. I don't know if it was to because we were at Damn Neck and it was maybe to blow out somewhere else. I don't even remember why we had Zodiacs. It might have actually been for like body recovery stuff if there was a drowning or just any type of waterborne operation. <laughs> maybe, but we had them and they were ours. So we're like, hey, we're doing this thing. So, you know, we open up this Connex box, pull out the Zodiacs, and in the we take all the paddles. So we each have our paddle. We land off. In the Iraqi desert, and my team, like, like my five, six guys plus the three record guys, each have a paddle. And I remember looking back as the, you know, the, the moon shining. You can just see guys walking across the desert with oars in their hand. It was, yeah, it was random. I still have that oar. As you should. As I that should. thing should be hanging on the wall somewhere. Yeah, so we smoked them. In, and so the other guys are at the target, and they just hear this 90-second firefight. And it wasn't really a firefight. It was very one-sided. But it just sounded as like As it should be. Armageddon. Yeah. And we end it, and I'm fired up. Like, I'm a brand new team leader, and we just own these dudes, and I'm like, holy shit. And I don't know, the first thing about guns, they had a bunch of guns. They had, like, some military body armor. That, oh, they no had shit. some military stuff, but I saw these things. I think, does FN something? I'm going to sound like a complete. FN is a gun manufacturer. I'm not a huge gun guy either, so. These guns look like M16s to me, but they weren't. <sighs> Maybe. I don't know, but I'm on the radio, like, I'm talking about, because the CEO actually came on the op, but he was over at the other target. I'm like, oh, yeah, we got military, U.S. military weapons, the whole nine yards. I'm just like, this is bitch. Turned out there was some military, U.S. military stuff there. But yeah, yeah some of my reporting wasn't very accurate. But yeah, I was fired <laughs> the fuck up. I was Dude, soaked. You're, what you're describing is 
what we learned pre 9 11. Frogman it, outs. Legitimately, the origins of the SEAL community come from a waterborne environment <laughs> to a place where they're never going to expect, get them in a complex ambush, and then fuck their shit up. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. The it only really way was. it could be better is if you were wearing Levi's. <laughs> yeah, really. Magazines in your back pocket. Those boats were literally sinking as we <laughs> kind of came up to. You look back on it, like I think we were trying to find little, those little actuators. Each guy had maybe had one on their belt because that's how we could scrounge up. Like we could all drown. Oh, a little water wing. Water wing. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, we were stoked, and I think we were supposed to go home like three days later. There was one more op, and we kind of bowed out. Like we didn't all need to go on it, so my team sat up. And we're like high five. Like we're good. You guys go get some. And uh, one of the, one of the funny side notes of that is those guys were so pissed that we just did that up that when they went and did the next one, they they got into a hornet's nest of some bad guys. But the first guy through the door, Leroy Jenkins, <laughs> ta, 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 and made made some fun with it. But Jesus. I think was Ob on that with you? I believe Ob was. Yeah, I think he was one of the recce guys. Yeah, he was telling me he t- briefly about some maritime operation. I was like, what? Ob. Obi, yeah, I could r- list off all the guys, but yeah. for sure. He seems to be doing well down in Florida, I think. Oh, yeah? I haven't talked with him, and we reconnected over text, and he is so funny. He was like, what was the name of your first team leader in gold? I need to make sure it's you. I'm like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> like, what kind of fucking Bodafides game are we playing over text? I'm like, it was HB. He's like, what does that stand for? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like fuck you, Obi. Remember when we went to sniper school? He's like, oh, okay, hey, what's up? <laughs> That's funny. What, yeah, was you- the, what was the low point? Extortion was huge. That was, that was just all of our friends. It was, and, and on some levels, by then I was a raging alcoholic. My family life was good. Like I, I never questioned um, my status at, at home, but I knew it wasn't ideal. Like I wasn't the best dad, I, but I wasn't worried about it all going away. But family life was wrecked. I was pretty fucking tired at that point. Um, yeah, losing all your buddies, and then some of the like those decisions I said I had to make it. That was that was horrific. Yeah. Did you notice an increase in his drinking? Oh yeah. Was it drastic or incremental? It was incremental until um, it was drastic. Until it was drastic. <laughs> it wasn't a problem until it was a problem. As are all things. Yeah. yeah and for me, it wasn't like loud, rude, mean. Well, I won't say that. There was some time. There was some occasions, yeah. but for the most part, it was sit at home alone quietly a withdrawal and, into yourself if you will yeah, yeah. yeah i drink like a, you know one of those a handle two three nights every single day i thought you were gonna say every night no but it was a good amount i mean i kill a half a bottle every night you could do better <laughs> um, i did you're something. lighter than me i was gonna say i've got better <laughs> but you're a lot lighter than me so it was uh, so he, you know when our marriage when our relationship started he was always the dork and and i was always the taskmaster did you just say dork? Yes. Just wanted to make sure. Yes. Dork. All right. Goofy. He yeah. was, you know, we'd play and wrestle, and he was always like the, and I was the one that made sure shit got done. But there was a point where he wasn't the dork anymore, so our, so it was like lopsided. I wasn't and, much of anything anymore. And no, he just withdrew at a tremendous rate. It's like so, you know, I would go off on. I was doing search and rescue for like seven years before we left Virginia. And I'd come home from a search. You know, I'm tired and I'm dirty and the dog's dirty. I got to wash the dog and feed myself. And I come home and I'd be like, where's Jacob? And he would be in his recliner with a glass of bourbon, not knowing where our kid was or that he was fed or whatever. And um, so that that was a downside big time. Like, hey, you're not pulling your weight around here. And I think that... In, in your guys' case, the job suffers last. You will pull every bit of bandwidth from every corner of your life to make sure the job is solid. So you're performing fine at work. So nobody at work notices yeah. that you're circling the drain because that's the last, that's what all your energy is spent on. I have to stay alive. I got to keep my guys alive. And I got to. Yeah. I don't know if I've picture. ever heard it described better than that. The job will suffer last, and you'll do everything you can to make sure that I couldn't agree with that more. <laughs> yeah, nailed it. Yeah. So you know your your alcohol intake may rise, your family life suffers, your relationships with your family, you know your extended family or whatever may suffer, but the job is solid. So you know the psychs at work, their job is to find out if you're not solid. 
but they're kind of behind the behind the game because your job is the last thing to suffer. So they may realize something's going on, but it's too late at that point. Yeah, I, I will ask people this question sometimes. You know, you got a high speed seal operator, right? Everybody at work is like, he's awesome. And then you find out he's maxed on three credit cards. You got <laughs> two DUIs. He's a functional alcoholic and he's flirting with losing his security clearance. Is he actually a good seal? Yeah. You know, it depends yeah. on the metric that you use as your judgment point of that. And my answer now is no, he's not, not because he's a ticking time bomb. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's this close. Yeah, to completely to... unhinging everybody that he's around too. Yeah, not just goes, him. When that goes high order, that's just not that's not one little firecracker. They're all fused together. No, I used to tell the, guy, the students all the time, like at this command, if you do something dumb, presidents call other presidents. It's yeah, like, when you yeah. So, or when you do something dumb out in town, you're on Fox News, you know. Yeah. The it's, old SEAL Team 6 nomaker. Yeah, that's fuck. SEAL Team 6-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I have not heard that, but it's going to be my goal in life to use that at least once a week moving forward. It's hard to get away from that culture, too, because if you're r at the verge of realizing you have issues with alcohol, that your family's crumbling – you're almost past the point of reconciliation because that's the culture you're living in where you're a badass and you're and especially now Work hard, every play hard. E every other month there's a toast so if you're trying to not drink oh yeah well, virginia uh, it beach became help. a mausoleum you can't everywhere you go you run into a wife a widow a buddy yeah any bar has got the pictures yeah so it's hard to separate from that culture while you're in it uh, and so one of the best things that we've done is, is to get out. And uh, I don't know if we miss it all that much at all. What, uh, how's your relationship with alcohol now? I don't drink. At all? No. How'd you stop it? I, I said I was going to stop quite a few years ago and then I would not drink for a little bit. And then I would drink a little bit on the trip on the road. Or then when she wasn't around, it would creep back in and then she'd be like, Hey man, here we go again. And I'd, I'd stop, and then it would creep back in and stop. And it, it literally, um, it got to, like, fuck, just less than a year ago. We'd, we'd already moved to Colorado, and I was free of Virginia Beach and, and almost done being retired. Um, but I was at a command. Um, my swan song was Sock North in Colorado. I wasn't really happy there. Some great people, but the, the job didn't stimulate me, and I was done. I didn't even know that. What were you doing there? I didn't Nothing. know that there was a command there. He, I would ask, I would wake up every day and be like, "So, are you going to go to work today?" And he's like, "Nah, I don't think so." Uh, yeah, it was, it <laughs> yeah was you a, can't fire a master chief. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I said that I ain't making E ten. So, no, that that's probably one of the bigger regrets of my career is just my my lack of. Is that somebody's phone? Sorry, that's Jacob. Get it. <laughs> you didn't silence your cell phone. It's fine. <laughs> no, the um. So right at the, right when we moved out to Colorado, I was doing pretty good. But then my dad got sick and ended up dying real quick within a, within a year. And and I just didn't I didn't give up the booze. But it was all quiet. We we lived at the Air Force Academy, but we'd already bought land up in the mountains, and there was a a garage up there with my wood shop. So every day I'd drive up there. It was a Unabomber shack. It was, <laughs> and I'd just sit up there and I'd drink alone and have fun in my woods and and uh, it was it was Mother's Day. Mother's Day last year, and I drove home, realized I, I was, was too hammy through the, through the mountains, realized I was way too hammered, pulled over, fell asleep. It was like 6 or 7 at, at night. I told her I was on my way. 11 o'clock, dunk, 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 knock on my window. It's a cop. And he and he, uh, he was pretty cool to me, but I never felt worse. He, he wrapped me up, took me to the to the sheriff's department, didn't arrest me or anything. Yeah. And then my son was actually out looking for me. So my son picked me up at the police station. So probably low mo moment in my career, but that was the one where just her and I had had a, a ton of uh, conflict over the years, every few months, every year about drinking. And that was a, the last one. We're just like, this is pathetic. Well, it wasn't social or recreational or, or anything at the point where I'm finding like hidden booze where now he's like hiding it. So then, you know, that's when it's a problem. 
it wasn't a problem until it was a problem, you know, and uh, withdrawing from the family and lying was my biggest thing. It's, it's just with my kids, with him, I that was drinking. always, <laughs> always the biggest thing that pissed me off was like, whatever you're going to do that's just shitty, about it. just tell me. But if you're going to lie to me, that's the thing that's going to ruin it right there. So um, there was a lot of, and I, I felt there were times when I was momming him. Basically, he was one of my kids that I was checking up on and like, you know, seeing if he was lying or where he was or, you know, go find my phone or whatever. Um, and that that's an awful place to be when you're a wife is that you're treating your husband like your child. And that is not a place I wanted to live in. So that was the day where it's like, we're going to fix this or we're not. Right, done. That's that's the decision you got to make. And that's why I say if he wasn't willing to go down that path and he's done a lot of work, it's not it's no easy path. You know, you got to really look inside yourself and talk to people <laughs> yeah. um, and and confront what's going on in there. And that's that's probably the hardest job ever is looking in, inward and dealing with all that dark stuff. So, yeah. um, you know, it was it was his decision and he's the reason that we're still together. Yeah, I'd say it's the opposite of that, but she's the reason. No, and leaving leaving the command was a huge relief, but I was still self-medicating with booze. And then coming out to Colorado, I was kind of away from everybody. Um, happy, but then my dad got sick and I was still medicating, medicating. But when that when that finally happened, it was a, a big eye opener. I don't know why that was the catalyst. Probably having my son pick me up at the sheriff's office was yeah. was fucking horrific. Um, but now that I'm removed from it, it's so nice. Yeah. Like, oh wow, we went out drink. We went out to dinner with friends. I didn't drink. I don't have to worry about what I said. I'm gonna feel just as good tomorrow as I did today. Like, there's so many, and I don't miss it at all. Yeah. At all. My desire to drink over the years has gone down exponentially a couple of glass of wine a couple of glasses of wine occasionally but other than that like i like feeling awesome when i wake up yeah but I, I i can't do that like most people can probably sit here at a pot and have a beer but then like for me i'd want to go back to my room and just keep drinking alone <laughs> some people like to go out to the bar and keep drinking i just i just wanted to numb myself yeah yeah i drank a lot of bourbon well uh, at least you recognize it. Yeah. At least you did something to correct it. Well, and I knew for years too. That was a that was a tough one. Well, he but, also could have taken the easy way out and been like, "Fuck it, leave." You know, and then he could have drank all own all he wanted for another six months, and then <laughs> I've been dead. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like the easy way out. I don't think that one is the easy way out. I mean, that, let me just tell you, it's a shotgun to the face of difficulties and pain and frustration going the divorce route. What would you say the divorce rate in the SEAL teams is? This is a guess. I mean, obviously, I don't have the stats, but what would you guys say? I know is? four people who are still married. I was going to say 75%. It's up there. And I, I think that most, I don't know, maybe this will sound self-serving. I, I think just we're high-achieving people, so we hang on to it for longer. So I think a lot of just train wreck marriages lasted longer than they even should have. So I, I'm i very careful to not talk about any of the specifics of my divorce just because it's not fair to Jamie. And yeah, yeah. I'll be the first person to tell you I'm not perfect. And I, if she ever wanted to sit down and talk about it, if we could ever get to that point, I'd be willing. But I will not talk details until she has the chance to as well. Yeah, that's, that's fair. <laughs> but what I can say and something that I recognized in what I think led to the divorce is our background will get you to hang on to things longer than you should in more situations than you should how negative is the term quitter to you internally and it doesn't matter what yeah. you associate it with you know it, fucking lighting your toes on fire and putting it out you fucking quitter you're like okay <laughs> i'm gonna have my toes on fire longer drinking quitter. drinking is another one quitter or you know i i need to get help quitter pussy whatever right? like any sign of weakness it's let's be honest the seal community is a piranha tank and you're looking for blood and you will get fucked up if they find a drop of blood but you're also looking for blood on your buddies too yeah, yeah. you love them but you also want to consume them so <laughs> but you'll stay I agree with you you'll stay 
longer because it has been ingrained for as long as I can remember as an adult that if you show weakness or if you give up, you suck. Yeah, I, I hear a and lot that too. And can be taken too far. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you have some to say on this, but a lot of guys will say, well, we're not very happy, but the kids, you know, we're staying no. together, the kids. My parents got divorced when I was 10, 9 or 10, and I was happy. Like, thank God. Because yeah. they weren't happy, and we weren't happy. But once they got divorced, it was way better. So I tell people all the time, don't do it for the kids. The kids aren't aren't having a good time here with mom and dad pissed every night. I don't know if my kids are happy about it. I have three kids. They're responding to it differently. We're 14 months into the process right now. It's not finished. But I also don't think they were happy about what was happening before, nor do I think they would have been stoked about what would have happened if we would have continued. What I think is it's at least... You know, and I've said this to all three of my kids. I don't want them to be turned off to the idea of marriage because I think marriage is awesome if you marry the right person yeah. and you have a healthy relationship. And just because your mom and I are getting a divorce doesn't mean that marriage is wrong. It means that this connection, this relationship, it's, it's no longer healthy. If people were going to stay for the kids, think about the example that you're setting. I mean, if you're at home every night screaming at each other, like that, I mean, what a worse example to set and what a great way to turn your kids off to marriage like oh i remember my mom and dad i don't want to do that shit yeah yeah i don't i don't buy the whole i'm going to stay for my kids example at all and it's not and it might not even be screaming at each other it might be and i don't jessica and i were never we were never toxic towards each other it never got to where we disliked each other she probably didn't like me sometimes but it was a lot of it can just be like parents don't talk at all it's fucking dead silent in the house every night which or is a lack equally. of respect between the parents as well or i mean yeah imagine that example kids see everything they hear uh, everything and it, it's i look back my like, god damn it i wish i could take all the things i wish i could really well not all of them because i've done some pretty fucking dumb things but a lot of the things that i have done that i would like to take back or examples that i set for the kids just the 100%. behavior or saying something it's like fuck that's how i feel yeah because they emulate, they see everything. They emulate. My my son's he just he's in the army now. He's in the infantry, just picking shit, having a blast, like shooting guns and hiking and talking tactics with me. It's so much fun. But <laughs> he saw me at my worst when he Does was he a teenager. Does he ever talk to you about it? Because I'm curious about what my conversations will be like with my kids in the future. He was pretty angry with that. Yeah, having to pick him up at the police station. Yeah, so that he, was he was angry for s- several months, week or two before he graduated high school. So we're we're better. We're we're definitely we're in that 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 level where I think there's mutual respect amongst both being in the military. We have a lot to talk about, but th- yeah. there's. Yeah, I think he's still pissed. We'll definitely have that conversation someday. Well, he also is going to have to go out and make his own mistakes before he's going to have some context. Um, you know, yeah. if anybody's looking at their dad and thinks their dad's perfect, let me just tell you right now, your dad's <laughs> fucking flying by the seat of his pants. <laughs> it's a dumpster fire most yeah. of the time. Like, I, I, I mean, yeah, wait until you're a dad. And you're a dumpster fire, and you might have a touch more empathy for your parents. <laughs> no, he can look at me and go, "Well, that guy as a as a military, as a Navy SEAL, he he did it right. Like I I made most of the right decisions in my career, and, and went a long ways, and survived, and and made rank. But as, yeah, as a as a family man, I think he can look back and say, "Well, he was courteous to mom. He wasn't mean. He wasn't rude. Yeah. He wasn't." And it violent. may take a touch for them to get there. And this is where I, I mean, I ask about your kids because I'm curious. I don't know what the journey is going to look like for my my oldest. Well, they have to move out of the teens, I think. I think so, too. And again, rough. I mean, I remember being 16. I knew everything. But I had no experience in anything. Very bizarre place to be. But I also understand them being there. So I know there's a component of time. It's just, I don't know. They need to go out and get some more life experience under their belt so they can have a better understanding. It's yeah. a shit show, though. It sucks. Our it daughter, does. I don't think, has much has had as much involvement because when in like 2010 I think she moved to California with her dad so she's been out of that shit show since since the beginning of high school so yeah I mean she heard plenty about it I'm sure um I think extortion happened the day she left so she was visiting us it happened early that morning, and then I had to take her to the airport. So she wasn't there for all the aftermath and the memorials and all that. So she's been removed from a lot of it, and I think that's 
helped her a lot because she's the one that feels things in our family. She's very <laughs> like emotionally intelligent and she can name all the feelings and everything. So um, that would have been really, really difficult for her because she absorbs all that emotion. Yeah. Um, so she, she's been really helpful for our son because he can call her, you know, and, and talk to her. And she's five years older, so she can give him more mature advice but also it's not coming from parents so mm. he's more receptive i think um it's been really helpful for her to be removed a little bit yeah it takes time yeah and many many times our, our kids are i think all of us are way tougher from it all it's a and, unique experience that i don't yeah well fuck just on the military side of the house I mean, mine were super young. The last deployment I did in 2010, my daughter was in a crib. I kissed her goodbye in a crib. And so that would put Tyler at, uh, what do we got here? Six years ago. So he was eight and Riley was, you know, 10. Or no, it was not even that. It was eight and six. And then he was shit. It was even below that. <laughs> six, four, and two. Now, Jacob was born in 2000. And just lived it. I remember when I when it came blood money time at nineteen to reenlist, and I remember asking her like, "Is this fair to everybody?" And she's like, ah, "They don't know any better. They don't know any different. This is their life." Yeah. So go for it, Jessica. What advice would you give to spouses? I it's to me. I think the portion of the military dynamic that has the least amount of the voice is the family side, specifically the female spouse side. Uh, don't expect it to be fair. As, as in a traditional relationship. So, you know, you can't, you can't expect the chores to be evenly divided. Um, you're going to take on a lot more of the traditional roles of a husband because yours <clears throat> is not going to be there. So don't expect it to be fair because it's not going to be fair. If you go in knowing that, it's going to be kind of lopsided as far as traditional roles go. I think you'll be a m much more accepting of what happens after that because you know it's not going to be quote unquote fair um, and and have your own life for God's sake because if you rely on the excitement from their job or something that job's not going to last as long as your marriage should so at some point that source of entertainment or whatever um, support is going to go away and you're still going to be stuck with each other. So yeah. have your own thing. Um, you know, I've run into people who are like, well, don't you know who my husband is? And like, no, I'm a horrible Navy wife. I don't know what any of that shit means like on the jacket. You and know, I don't I'd... ever actually want to talk to anybody <laughs> that says, don't you know who I'm like, oh, I am out. Now I don't want to know. over. Far. Yeah. So you can't ride on that on those coattails. You have to have your own thing. Um, I would go to school and learn stuff. I have all kinds of certificates that I'll probably never use. But, um, you know, I, I did search and rescue. I had my own set of non-military friends. So I think that that's a big deal. Key as well. She did all kinds of – she was a 911 operator. She was a probation officer. She did search and rescue. Just always doing something. And I was welcome to join her like when it was time to go do things. But she realized, like, Jason really doesn't want to. And stay here if he wants, but I'm, I'm going to go do my thing. Yeah. And that was really important for the kids, too, to see that I'm not sitting home, you know, waiting or twiddling my thumbs or worrying or crying or whatever. I was out and doing things and they were doing their things. And um, sometimes we would all do some things together. So, um, yeah, big chunk of your happiness is not going to come from that portion of your life. You have to find fulfillment somewhere. Yeah, I think that individual independence is huge. Because mm -hmm. that when when shit hits the fan, you have nothing to fall back on. You know, all your interests lie with that, or all your activities lie with the command, or you're only doing you know this little pocket of stuff um, in or social or work or whatever. Um, and if that goes away, you're both screwed. So I mean, he's not in the military anymore, but I've been doing my own thing. So. It doesn't really affect me. Yeah, his occupation as much. doesn't really matter right. in your own pursuits. How'd you guys link up with O2X? It, so Adam LaRue is one of the, the co founders, and we knew each other at the command. He was at the command for a while. Um, Shumi, of all people, Shumi was the psych that like, always 
give credit for saving my life. She reached out to me after I left Virginia and was like, hey, you'd probably be really good for this thing. You know, I, she knows that I'm, I'm an advocate for mental health. Um, so she hit up Adam and said, you might want to reach out to Jason. So, so Adam called me up and said, hey, you want to give this thing a whirl? And yeah, they're fun. I, I work. When I, I love the gig economy. Like I live in the middle of nowhere up in the mountains in Colorado, but I travel once a month or twice a month and work for yeah. a week, and I get to go back to my little hobbit hole. And talk about stuff that's important to you. Yeah, so out, to you. out there I can – some of the stuff, you know, strength and conditioning is not something I was ever into. I stayed in shape because I had to, but it, it's not something I'm passionate about. But but I can say, hey, these are the reasons why, as a firefighter or police officer, you need these things. But yeah. But when we get into injury prevention, like at your age, if you don't warm up, you're going to pull a hamstring and you're going to be, everybody's going to tease you. Or if you don't get a good night's sleep, you're going to be a basket case. And if you're a basket case and if you don't eat well, then all this stuff touches. It's very holistic. So, yeah, the, I started working with O2X and she's all about all that stuff, too. So she she joined on as well. And you're working, Jessica, more on the resiliency side of the house? Yeah. So they don't have a piece for spouse resiliency fully formed yet yeah um but that's... i'm telling you i think it's the most underserved aspect and it that uh, ability to like buttress and support the family from that side it makes the warfighters so much more oh yeah when you tell lethal. 40 firefighters like these are the things you need to do in order to keep your head in the game to be efficient at your job but in the back of their mind there's like fuck wife kids garbage lawn divorce alcoholism all Washing that stuff machine. the wives need to hear this the spouses need to hear this yeah yeah, so we're we're hoping that we can um, get this piece developed for spouses to come in. Um, you know, we talk about resiliency and how to better prepare if someday shit hits the fan. And I think first responders in our country are they have way worse jobs than you guys going off. You deploy. It's it's dangerous over there. But when you come home, it's not dangerous here, right? So you get a chance to kind of decompress a little bit. Police officers, they're on every single minute. And if they live in the community that they police, yeah, there's, no off, there's time. no off time. They're always on. They're always vigilant. And so they don't ever get a break. I mean, military gets a break to yeah. some extent. And we, we see the the horrific stuff overseas but we leave it there they see the car accident with the mom and the kids that are mutilated i remember talking to one firefighter he's like every day i drive to work i go past the place where i saw the family get wiped out in a car accident i was going to go buy a house but i can't really buy that house because i also did cpr on an infant or something like their whole lives are just surrounded by this carnage so what o2x does is is huge for these people because yeah. they always look at me like well you're talking about these things that you did overseas that affected you mentally. We've never seen any of that. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I did a paramedic stint for three months as a corpsman at Team 5. And the horrific shit I saw every single day there, it messes with you. And it's in your backyard. It's in your own town. So those guys, what, what first responders deal with doesn't compare to what we did. We got a break from it. We got to leave it. They're in it. And we were kind of, I mean, if we're being honest, we were voluntarily pursuing that environment. And when we engage, I mean, think about this, if the violence that you've engaged with in your life overseas, was the vast majority of it on your terms, meaning you, you got to initiate? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there's something huge in that, right? You're well, not that... responding to a 911 call where you're just snapshot into a situation and you have to deal with it. Yeah. You planned, it was calculated, Snuck and it was in. on your terms. Yeah, absolutely. Imagine being on the receiving end of that. Your fucking brains would be scrambled. Now you you talk to you know like the the infantry guys or the 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 mechanized guys in the military who just sat around and waited for their car to get it blown up. I can't even imagine. They that. had no control in any of that. We yeah. had we had control ninety nine percent of the time. Uh, yeah, high ninetieth percentile of the time. Any time we encountered or touched violence, it was because I chose in a place where I had the advantage. Yeah, yeah. It's I you know I can't even imagine being a first responder right now. To be honest. Caught. I mean, firefighters, whatever, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, there's a saying that um, people wave with five fingers to firefighters and, and they wave with one to police officers. Yeah, I'm friends with a lot of the cops here. I mean, it, I don't know. The conversation, I'm lucky in the respect that I get to have deeper conversations with them. You know, maybe a lot of people don't know cops or they work in. And, no, I have a really good friend that's a, a firefighter in St. Paul. So he's 
he's amongst it. And another good friend that was a Minneapolis police officer years ago. And man, and it, can you imagine going? I don't know. It's it's like being a Vietnam vet or something, and just everybody spitting on you and shitting on you on your way back from war. Like that's what these guys deal with. I don't know how you have a good feeling about what you do. It's, I feel for those guys. That's, that's I, I think that need for um, supportive family is for for sure right now especially right now they really need that um and if they have that stress at work and then come home and have other stressors that's that's double whammy well i think you're going to like they're not going to avoid stress at work and they're certainly going to have stress at home what they need is avenues and ways that they can address them and deal with them that to me is the biggest yeah. thing like if you have a stress for your life please hit me up because i would like to go down that path i would like some of that action i haven't figured that out yet but the ability and again for me it, like it's huge. The days I get to talk with a guy that I talk with, it's massive. That mental health, yeah. mental uh, hygiene aspect of it is it couldn't be more important. In my well, opinion. if you have that, if you ha if your family has a healthy resilience, then you're not going to be as stressed out at home. So, yeah. is, uh, how is the idea of that program, the I call it a holistic family approach, is that being received well by the first responder community? Well, we haven't been able to present it yet. COVID's kind of halted that COVID. um we did work on some online um i don't know if that's up or not yeah but um i don't know i guess they they felt i was a good fit i'm the only military spouse i think that that works for them um but i have worked on an ambulance so i have that kind of first responder background What's i did 911 yeah, um, so and, and then i did probation so i've also got that kind of law enforcement background um, but I think the biggest draw for them is my PhD in military spousing. <laughs> Getting shit on by the <laughs> command for years. Um, so I think that that's that life experience you can't get in a classroom. So um, hopefully it'll be helpful to first responder families. To And some spouses are also first responders. You have that dual household, you know, where you have a paramedic and a firefighter that, you know, they sometimes work together. So... That would be very difficult. I feel like that would be an incredibly hard situation to escape those stressors. I mean, what are you going to talk about? Work. <laughs> Inescapable. At least they're talking, you know, and, yeah. and at least yeah. they're talking to somebody about some, some aspects of their job. And maybe it's just a bitch about their management or something, but at least they're talking, I guess. So what the hell are you going to do with the rest of your life, Jason? Drag the road. I get it. <laughs> I like to weed eat, and I got to plow for the truck this year. I, I plowing. I, I love plowing. Do you, I, I mystery plow people's driveways. Ah, yeah. Not the whole way though. I just pack it up and then just... <laughs> build them a berm that they can't get out. Yeah, of. it's like oh my bad. No, I do the whole. You'll see when we go out to the house tonight. I do like the. I loved it. Like so, I'm like fuck yeah. Time to. I love mindless menial tasks. Yeah, I I don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I I, I want to spend it with this one, up Aww. in the mountains. Um, <laughs> I enjoy what I'm doing now, like kind of the gig economy thing, working a yep. week here and there. Um, I love woodworking. I always thought I'd turn that into a business. Maybe someday I will, but right now I just like making what I want to make. What do you make? Like what kind of stuff do you put together? Everything. Well, Furniture. at some point you're going to run out of space for this everything. Like what's yeah. the last project you did? The roof. That doesn't count. <laughs> the nook? He I, made I our built, breakfast I nook. built the breakfast nook table and the benches. I built... Okay. Yeah, just whatever. Okay. I build art. I'll turn thing bowls on lathe and carve them. I built our bed. Um, anything. Okay. Yeah, I just like making things. It's right. pretty high end stuff. I bet it is actually. You could turn that into a business. I could, but it could also be a gig economy as well. Do you create a website and put two things up? Either, well, I, uh, either buy these items or go fuck yourself. You well, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of what got me initially. I was making a lot of things on the lathe, bowls and carving them, and and they were just cluttering the house up and she's like hey come on we got to get rid of this stuff so i started an etsy page and sold a bunch of it and then just never really did it again i still yeah. make things here and there the, i think the problem is is if somebody says hey i want five of these things made just like this i'm like i don't want to make those things no no see don't do it that way yeah these are my offerings yeah visit my website or don't yeah someday i'll get back to that right now i'm just having fun with the property building shelves a nook uh, built in bookcases for the office or whatever just kind of getting it set up but someday yeah it'd be fun to just toil around in my my wood shop and yeah get Cutter. old and crotchety <laughs>
What about you, Jessica? What do you want to do? I'm doing what I want to do pretty much. I I would pay O2X to give me work right now because I'm climbing the walls. I'm not ready to retire or sit at home and be crotchety or plow or whatever. Yeah. We've been doing nothing I, for four months. <laughs> I've been cooking a lot. Um, but I definitely would love to get after it. I think that um, the mission, O2X's mission, is is perfectly aligned with what I want to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd love to pursue that and, and see that grow. I think there's extreme value from that from both of you. One of the things, it everything I do, like professionally or for a living or people pay me to, none of them were my idea. Not a single goddamn one. The podcast, not my idea. <laughs> Public speaking, not my idea. A buddy of mine hit me up one time. I was like, you were a SEAL, right? They usually put the word team after that. <laughs> Come talk to us about teamwork. And I was like... Do a good job. Care more about the per. What, what did they say to us and buds? Oh yeah, be carry your weight. You know all that. Lead crap. by example. But there is an incredible amount of knowledge that comes from what you did for so long, and you can pass it along, generationally pass that knowledge along. And the same thing on your side of the house, though, too, Jessica. And that there's plenty of people like you and me that are out there like passing on military lessons. Miles. I don't think there's many people out there who have the experience, knowledge, and background that you do from the family side of the house. So uh, my recommendation would be is do not stop. Now, we saw something once. Oh, I'm blanking on his name. He was the command sergeant major of JSOC at the time, but old school dude. He was, he was during in Somalia during Black Hawk Down, and, and so his 30-year his career was insane like ours was, but at a higher leadership level. And him and his wife came to the command and, and did sort of, a, I want to call it a skip, but it was it was the two of them talking about their marriage and, and all the things that he went through that we could relate to. Yeah. This event, that event, and what he was doing, and, and then and then the wife's perspective of it. And I always thought that, that was it was really resounding. It was like a thing. co-ed kind of TED talk almost, like they had us in a little amphitheater and, and they both told their side, and that was really helpful. Because I mean, I, of their experience. Mm -hmm. You guys share it, right? And I think that they were um, also presenting NICO as a as a opportunity for guys. That's right. Did so, you go through NICO? Yeah. I did too. That was awesome. It was great. I liked it because I, I knew, like, what's wrong with you? We can't really fix because of the TBI and stuff getting blown up, but but I understood what was happening in my brain, like the the bandwidth limitations you're having, and um, just understanding what was going on in my head was a huge help. Was uh, I enjoyed that? That was helpful for me too. Yeah, because I, I was like, "Why aren't you operating at peak husband performance right now?" <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> I don't know. Was that a slide? No, I don't yeah. know. It was pretty, <laughs> apparently, pretty demanding. Uh, but, expecting you know, peak performance. Think about Nico though. Again, they're bringing in something other than just the service member. They're taking it a step or a paintbrush wider, and they're bringing in the family. Well, they were inclusive, and yeah. we were brought up. You know, my my wife generation was brought up on the don't ask questions diet. So, you know, it, it just was what it was. Nobody was going to really explaining it to us or anything. So for them to be like, oh hey, this is your husband's brain scan, and this is what we found, and scientifically that made more sense to me than yeah, he's just fucked up now. Like, deal with that. So it was nice to have that why you know reasons why and then they did bring the spouses in i was there the last week and um you know you talk to the psych and yeah. and it gives them a much more well-rounded idea also because they're only hearing what these guys are saying and sometimes it's not always true <laughs> <laughs> so they're That's hearing the other perspective so <laughs> from a treatment standpoint they're they're grateful for that additional information yeah, and again, it's. I just think that if you focus only on the one portion of the equation, you, you're going to get half of an answer. I think the more that they can involve the family, the, the better that it will be. I love their 360 healthcare approach, where the docs meet once a day, a week, or whatever. That's they, right, they all do, meet. Don't they? So the, all of the, the stibulary person meets with the nutritionist, meets with the osteo guy, meets with the MRI neurology person, and they all talk about the one patient. And um, nobody probably, does a decision. Nobody makes a decision without everybody else agreeing. Yeah. So, but when you leave NICO, that 360 approach does not follow you. So, nor they, does that level of uh, healthcare no. provider. I'm assuming you went to uh, Walter Reed. 
Same. Yeah. Yeah, they flew me out there. And it's like, yo, go, you need to go get this done. I was like, fuck, where do I need to drive to? They're like, no, it's the second door on the left. Yeah. You know, every, I was Everything. like, holy shit. Best yeah. medical treatment I've ever received. Yeah. But they made him out. Yeah, why though? Because they were civilians. Oh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then they, you come out and they give you like a plan, right? Yeah. But then it's on the service member to go make sure that happens. Yeah. Which means it's on the spouse to make sure the service member goes to make sure that that happens. And then you're going to places like Portsmouth. So you're not getting that level of care. They don't understand your background. They're not putting in what the psych or their neurologist or whatever. They're not hearing what all, all those other providers are, are saying. So it wasn't as great. But at least he had a direction, you know, to take it. And they weren't, they weren't full of meds either. They're not like, oh, you have pain and you have this and you have that. Well, here, take all these psych meds and all these pain meds. They were very limited. I think they even took you off maybe something or other. So um, yeah, they were offering acupuncture. They were talking Reiki. about yoga. Right. They were, yeah, I mean, everything. I mean, it was the last ditch of, I mean, they didn't, well, they did try to prescribe me an antidepressant, but I was flying at the time. So I was like, oh, I'll just take that, yeah. and get rid of it. But yeah, it was, it was not a first approach. No, well, good. they brought in other treatments, you know, Eastern medicine, Western medicine, and not all of it stuck. Art like therapy, he didn't, music yeah. therapy, dogs, horses, like the whole nine yards. He, I didn't do very well with the art therapy. How about you? I didn't end up doing it because I'm I a did, woodworker. I, like, I understand that that was valuable. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't need to do art to make me feel better. I know that works. I want to try this person who I've never met. Like, I'm going to try some other neat thing. So. And not all of it was for everybody. Like, he didn't like the Reiki because he had to close his eyes with a stranger and with the door closed, you know, like that wasn't comfortable or relaxing for him at all. Um, but the scraping, he really loved that. Or the, really? we took it, we did couples yoga when I was there on my last, you know, the last week. So, and we've done that since yeah, together. Yoga's, yoga's key. I so, refuse to do it. Yeah. So it's it key. wouldn't work for you. I do jujitsu, which is like folding clothes, but there's people in them. Yeah. You know, that's kind of yoga. <laughs> Sometimes you're, you do your savasana, but with the 300 pound man laying on top it's of it. It's involuntary you. yoga. I've heard yeah. it described as that. It, God damn, it's. But it, but it is helpful to you in your way. So, I mean, there's a lot of different yeah. therapies out there, and not all of them are going to work for everybody. If I hadn't found jujitsu, I probably would still be cranking wingsuit base jumping. Yeah. And then, the, you know. Might not be here. Yeah, I mean, I unfortunately know quite a few people who are not because they kept going statistically in that perspective. I, I have to just really quick. I figured it'd be her, but it's definitely me. I have to use the restroom. Go pee. Whew. I appreciate you taking it till the excruciating. I end, was though. dying. I'm sweating right now. I, was <laughs> I forget the hell we were talking about, though. I apologize. Nico. I don't care. I don't even. Oh yeah, Nico. I don't even know what we were talking about the last ten minutes. I was just like. <laughs> when are we going to start this podcast? Well, I forgot to hit record, so we need to restart. <laughs> we'll uh, restart and do the whole thing over again. Which have I've you done, done that? Oh, You've done that before. Like at you? least an hour into it, and you look down. I used to have a board that I would look at, and it has a button that's either green or red. Red is what you want it to look like if you're actually recording the things that are coming out of your mouth, and it's been there, and it's like, oh, fuck. And okay, then you, and then you like try to fake make up for what you were just talking about. You can try, but it's it it doesn't work whatsoever at all it's 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 horrendous i guess that then there's really only one important question and that is what do you guys want to get for dinner i don't know you tell me this do you have time. like weird dietary requirements now that you're like a health freak no as long <laughs> as it's not labeled healthy i'm good yeah right. he's only a health freak because like i won't buy what we shouldn't be eating and he doesn't care enough to go buy it himself so and i don't even think we're health freaks we just Eat pretty well. Yeah. We, and then I hard. and then I work out it's every not. day and he just feels guilty, so he does it. So it's not guilt's a powerful motivator. <laughs> I support it. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, we eat healthy because she eats healthy, so I eat healthy. And then I exercise because yeah, she exercises. I can either sit there in the living room while she's doing yoga or something and feel like an asshole or either join her or do my own workout. That's called Wachasana. Watch asana. Watch asana. Yeah. You know how there's like different poses in yoga. They all are like blah, 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 asana. That one's called watch asana when you just watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, he, and then he probably feels pervy, but. Nah, not really. <laughs> 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 I do enjoy a good Jessica in a yoga pants pose for sure. That's a good thing. 
after being together for so long. It That's is. a good thing. Yeah. Well then, you guys want to go get some food? Let's do it. You guys can close it out however you want to. Anything to add, Jason? Words of wisdom? No, I don't, I don't know. I hopefully I didn't come across as shitting on the command or all this no. over the over the so years. So you can confirm this, right? Your words of wisdom that I am probably still the same jackass I was when you met in the late nineties. <laughs> People yeah. don't believe me. They're like, "No, you weren't a jackass." I'm like, "Oh no, I was a jackass, and I still am a jackass." Can I can I can I let your audience know something? A, yeah, a do piece? it, do it. <laughs> you can't reach the button from here. So you, I hear you say this a lot. I listen to a lot of your podcasts. I love them, and you talk about how you were a, a C, an average player, and you you operated at the highest level, and I think it pissed a lot of people off. New guy come in, you outshot most people, you outjumped people, you, out, you, you outperformed. You did very, very well. You were a very high performer, and you were very, very sarcastic. And <laughs> So you pissed a lot of people off, I would assume. I think sarcasm is- You are not been, average at, at any level. I never felt I was above average. I, I'm be, I am dead serious when I describe it like that. I, w- I could point out in any one of those disciplines people that could fucking eat my lunch on any given day. Shooting, jumping. A guy or two, maybe, on a day. But I think, like I always joke that I was I was consistently average. Like I, I just, I performed for a on lot of years. On what scale though? Like you're considered oh, mediocre it's, it only in can, like this- uh, But it can only be on your peers. One percent, yeah. It has to be against your peers. No, but if we would go shooting, I shot okay. I was never the fastest and I was never the slowest. When you jumped, I could keep yeah. up. But I wasn't the best. Yeah, you, you'd always perform. Yeah, I think you're a high performer at that command. Some things came better to me than others. Keeping my mouth shut was not one of those. No, no, <laughs> no. It would have been. It's. It's. And I think you know. I hate that adage. Everything happens for a reason. But I'm sure you getting shot was for whatever it happened. But it'd yeah. been interesting to watch you spend a lot of years there. I don't know what would have happened. I would have stayed for sure. Fuck. I mean, I could have been on that. I would have been in if I. Let's say I would have two troop, two troop, which yeah. would have put me on extortion. You know, it's yeah. who knows though. It's, yeah, I went to Bud's with uh, Jonas. He was a good dude. Jonas, and the serial killer. Yeah. Jonas, I, I used to joke about him and that he would he had dead bodies buried in his, his backyard. If somebody came up to me and was like, hey, we just, there was a raid on Jonas's house and downstairs they found mason jars with heads in it. I'd be like, yeah. Not okay. surprised. <laughs> he was the best. I remember he was a brand new O, came out to like add a green team, went on and off with us with no responsibility. He's just one of the guys. And uh, we went on some target in Afghanistan, and he went with a couple of guys around a corner to this building, and there was just like seven dudes in there with chest racks. AK- <laughs> He's sucking fucking frag grenades to the window, and I'm like, that is never, ever going to happen to you ever again, yeah. you piece of shit officer. Get your fucking <laughs> grease pencil out and get in the goddamn back. He was just a, he was through yeah. the roof. He was so fired up. I'm like, you're so lucky. That's oh, never going to happen. Yeah, it's... Fuck. Yeah, who knows? I, you know, I don't know. I don't think I would have. I don't know if I would have survived there or not. Who knows? I'm glad that, you know what? I, I used to think back at looking, getting shot was like a horrendous thing. We wouldn't be sitting here today having this conversation had no. it not happened. I wouldn't have become a buds instructor. I wouldn't have started speaking. I wouldn't have done the flying stuff. It, it, it's no, so it's many crazy. things happen because of that. Yeah, your, your trajectory has been a trip to watch for sure. Fuck, dude, I'm the one who is, like, wild. sitting on the <laughs> bullet, and I'm just like, ah, where is this going? I just – I try to take the advice of people who are s- smarter than me, which fortunately for me is every person that I meet. So, <laughs> Well, you've had some neat people. You had fucking Joe push you, like, start a podcast. You're articulate. Yeah. And that was, again, crazy friendship. The guy I met randomly, and we have stayed in touch, and he couldn't be more supportive. And it's like, okay, I have a guy who has the most successful podcast on the face of the planet telling me I should continue – I will. I will take your advice. Yeah. Doesn't he look like Joe? No. I, I like if you hold <laughs> pictures up next to each other, like a little bit. I mean, they neither of them have hair. Both bald. Yeah. Joe's a savage, though. He's a stout, <sighs> stout man. Yeah. Yeah. He likes to fold people I, or he, fold clothes with people still in them I as bet. well. Yeah. He's, I haven't rolled with him. He's been injured for quite some time. I saw a video of him one time. I don't know why it popped out. It was random, but he, he was kicking something. I was just going to say. Like some you, back spinning kick and Jesus, they would have kicked me through the wall into the next building. It was insane. Yeah. He's it an interesting sense. cat for sure. Well, I can't tell you guys how much I appreciate you 
making the travel to come up here. Thanks for having us. This this is neat. Well, it's not over. Now we're just going to turn the microphones off and they continue to have a conversation. <laughs> Can't take them with us to the restaurant. It'd be shitty background noise. It would be. <laughs> yeah. You guys ready? Can to- I, I do just want to say one thing that I've never done jujitsu, but our son did it for a couple of years. And um, I think as a female, it would have been, I have a black belt in something completely bizarre called Hatmudo, which I don't even think is an actual martial art. Um, but instead of that, I wish I had done jujitsu because okay. it is the one martial art that is actually helpful to you as a human in real life. I have a black Especially belt if you're a woman. In bullshitsu, <laughs> which is also not a martial art. Yeah. It comes ties into the sarcasm. I've had that shit since I think I was like four, though. But I have a blue belt in jujitsu, and it is humbling. But I tell you what, I think of my own daughter and... I all I could ever want for her is the ability to never feel physically at a disadvantage. And if you, and, I mean, I I feel stupid being an advocate for jujitsu, having done it for so like I actually tried not to talk about it very much because I'm I'm fucking know anything. You know, it's, it seems weird to me. But if you know a little bit, and the person that you're up against doesn't know any, it's kind of comical. Yeah, and it doesn't. It's like what the fuck. We all have the same body and like, you know, the joints are like, oh, okay, these all work the same. And it's like, um, I guess I'll just get up when you're going to let go of me because I can't go anywhere. <laughs> but for a woman, I'm only five feet tall. I don't yeah. weigh very much. So uh, it takes away that empowering. disadvantage because yeah. in any other stand up thing, you're at a disadvantage. You're well, going to, you're, if you're a woman and you're being attacked, yeah. you're probably going to end up on the ground. And, and then you're jiu-jitsu, still even going to, though, even with jujitsu. But I think. But you, you're in an advantage when you're there. Yeah. You're going to be always, though, at a disadvantage, probably weight and strength. What it's going to do is give you the tools that I would say, I would describe it as helping neutralize some of those things at the very least you'll be able to survive until a higher level of care or help can get there because if you don't know anything i mean you imagine walking around every day being physically scared that's one thing i realized like i just i don't like i it's, it never crosses my mind no. but then i think about my daughter i'm like fuck or women in general like it's, it's just something that i'd never put the thought into of I don't care if it's dark outside. I'm like, I'm going to walk to my car. I don't think twice. No. Nope. But I, I don't want my daughter to be like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I need to wait for somebody. Like, I want her to be empowered. And yeah, it's a good skill to have. Well, if you consider the average attacker is not going to know any jujitsu. So if you know some, you're going to be you're better off. Yeah. And it's, it's not, again, from my very inexperienced understanding of it it's not rocket surgery like there's some rocket surgery. it's not there's <laughs> concepts much like shooting like hey side alignment trigger control that's Squeeze to the side break and it's like 80 percent, right it's actually gonna really it's you're like gonna, four things do these four things every time and be so just, there's some frameworks that you build on if you can get the foundational principles dialed you're pretty good you might not be able to win, but you're sur- I mean, it starts with survivability. Like for, at best, I hope that I'm a pain in the ass to people that I roll with. Like I don't ever want them to be able to tap me out. I can't beat you, but like you're exhausted and I'm exhausted, but I didn't tap. So therefore I win. So you're a big defense right now as you're learning. I think it starts off that way. Yeah. I mean, because I think if you start off with pure, you're just going to get murked. <laughs> if you come at people. Here's I mean, my arm, please. Oh my God. Oh my God. The stronger you are, I think the more at a disadvantage you are starting off, because you you like it's you're just shaking, you're squeezing so hard, and then thirty seconds later you're exhausted, and people are just they're overtly laughing at you. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty gnarly. It's been a cool two year journey. That's awesome. Yeah, and for women out, out there, I would have, go out do jujitsu yeah. now. Out of all the martial arts, it's the most practical. I agree for sure, and it, you know. I'm not saying anything negative about other martial arts because I think you can get discipline or work ethic or whatever, fill in the blank. But as far as, you know, defending yourself against getting punched in the face or assaulted, you're probably very, very top of the list as far as I'm concerned. So Never too late to start. There's people I do class with, women and men, who have got to be in their 60s. I think I did I one class when my friend Stacy was working at Lynx. And, um, yeah. Oh, you guys I, I are a little a, bit geographically probably separate yeah, from the gym. I did one class with race. her, but but um, she's a little bit bigger in the boobular area than I am. So mm. that was a really interesting you can obstacle that... <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if that's true, but I mean... <laughs> People could tap to the boobs. I guess you could smash somebody's face. Here, Okay, I'm going to ask your opinion on this because I was talking about it on the episode I did Friday. 
you don't have any hair, so you. But if you did, would you get a perm? All right, this is sort of weird. I have a friend of mine, Bob, who lives in Minnesota, and he's he heard I was coming on this, and he's like, "Yeah, I looked up your buddy, and he said something about growing his hair out and getting a perm." I'm like, "What the fuck is yeah, he talking today, about?" Yeah, today, this Friday, the episode that came out today. Okay, I people are telling to me not one. to get a perm, which you know me pretty well. That's I'm like, "Oh, don't get a perm. Fucking <laughs> check this perm out." You should definitely get a perm. I don't have hair. If I had hair, I'd still shave it off. I was forced to not have hair since I was like 22 or three, yeah. but it's the best. Jason used to have a mullet. I used to. That's powerful. Though. Party in the back, yeah. But <laughs> if you could get a perm once, because you could always shave it off right after that, would you at least get the perm to say you had the perm with pictures? With pictures for the yeah. for the picture aspect of it. Then go to jujitsu and tap people to the <gasps> perm. Ooh, that's. And then bad. make a shirt that says "I tap to the perm" and fucking give it to them. I think that's winning. See, you're you're taking this whole psychological <laughs> warfare aspect of it, which you're good at. <laughs> I'm going to look stupid and then beat your ass looking stupid and then make you tap to that. And memorialize like that. it with a shirt with that the shirt. I'll give you for free. Tap to the perm. Yeah, and then the money can go to... Whoever. Yeah. To hair research. Calls. Hair research. Because <laughs> I'm going to buzz it anyway. It's like, I just haven't cut my hair because we're in the middle of a very bizarre era where I don't need to cut my hair. So It all makes sense now. Yeah, my friend was just telling me via text a couple hours before you picked this up. Yeah, talking about getting a, a perm. I'm like, sure it's the right handy. Yes. Apparently it is. It is. On that note, let's go get dinner. You guys ready? You'll be the Permanator.